Chapter Twelve of Plain Living by Rolf Boulderwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Twelve. About a week after this conversation, Hubert dropped the local paper he was reading in the evening with such a sudden exclamation that his mother and sisters looked up in mild astonishment. Well, I'm gone, as Dan Peggotty has it," he said at length nothing will ever surprise me again as long as there is such a crop of fools in the world no wonder that rogues like dillison flourish after all i said too listen to this headed important sale of station we have much pleasure in noticing that our energetic and popular neighbour mr dillison has completed the sale of his well-known station wantabalry with fifty four thousand six hundred sheep of a superior character to colonel dacre a gentleman lately arrived from england furniture stores station horses and cattle given in the price is said to be satisfactory well the devil help some people said hubert how that poor gentleman could have run into the snare blindfold after the talking to father and i gave him i can't make out mark my words he's a dead man financially unless it's going to rain for years dealison is a very astute man remarked mr stamford musingly as a persuasive talker he has few equals fine frank engaging manner too bold and ready-witted i think i can see how he managed it well i can't see can't make it out at all said hubert unless he is a mesmerist no doubt he made the most of being on bad terms with windigill he would rake up that old story of the disputed sheep tell it his own way get that fellow osprey who always goes about with him to back him up also make small concessions such as furniture and working plant talk about the house and garden that would be attractive to a new arrival and if colonel dacre is at all impulsive and i think he is he has thus landed him i wonder what the colonel will think of dealerson about three years from this time i'll tell him what i think of him the next time we meet in public said hubert squaring his shoulders while a dangerous light came into his eyes if he could be tempted into giving me the lie i should like to have the pleasure of thrashing him gently my boy said mr stamford we must not set up ourselves as the redressers of wrongs for lower morama few people are in a position to discharge the duties of that appointment i honour your righteous indignation all the same and trust you will always retain an honest scorn of wrong and wrongdoers i should hope so said laura i can't imagine hubert holding his tongue discreetly or passing by on the other side there are a good many levites in this part of the world i am afraid oh my gracious said linda who was reading a closely written letter think of this isn't his name colonel john dacre late of the seventy fifth regiment there is one redeeming feature about the affair at all events what can that be said laura and hubert both together why there's a distressed damsel in the case if i didn't know better i should think that hubert must have heard about her listen to this and she read aloud i hear that you are about to have delightful neighbours i was told that colonel dacre was going to settle in your neighbourhood he has bought wantabalry station young groves told me last night he is a widower handsome and middle-aged but i don't mean him he has an only daughter also a son think of that jane robinson met her in mrs preston's where she is staying she says she is most sweet handsome though not objectionable in the beauty girl line clever sensible distinguished-looking etc take care of hubert if you don't want to lose him for good and all that's from nelly conway oh isn't that lovely and here linda held the letter aloft and danced for joy i don't see what difference it makes said hubert gloomily except that there are three people to be ruined instead of one you girls are always thinking of marriage and giving in marriage 
"'Now don't be provoking, Hubert,' said Laura, coaxingly. "'We know somebody who is not always thinking about cattle and sheep. "'Now listen to me. "'How long will it take for Mr. Dillerson to ruin them?' "'About three years,' said Hubert. "'Depends on the terms. "'Of course he's got all the colonel's cash, "'but he would take long-dated bills rather than let him slip. "'Say three, three and a half. "'That's the very outside month that means that we are to have the society and companionship of the very nice girl for three or four years said laura we can ask her here for the last six months you know i really think hubert it won't turn out such a bad investment for the colonel after all you'd better marry him out of pity said hubert get father to endorse his bills and that will effectually finish up the stamford family as well stock lock and barrel i'll complete the tragedy by marrying mr dealerson said linda whom i shall afterwards poison then come on to the stage and repent in white satin in my last agonies having by mistake taken some out of the same glass what a charming melodrama who says there are no australian romances possible in real life no but nonsense apart said laura i intend to make a friend of miss Deck she will be rather lonely there are no decent people within twenty miles of montabari you must drive us over to call directly we hear that they have arrived at the station it is a pleasant house and the garden is lovely to give mr dillerson his due you girls generally manage to persuade everybody to do as you like said hubert making believe to be sulky still but putting his arm round laura's waist it's a pity you didn't tackle the colonel about not buying the beastly place instead of father and me he'd have dropped it like a shot most likely don't you worry yourself any more about it said linda you have been faithful to the colonel as mrs christianson always says and done the honest and disagreeable now let it rest you're bordering on a levant retorted her brother however it was always the fashionable side about a fortnight after the return of the family party when most of the books had been read when all the songs had been sung when every conceivable incident that had happened in sydney had been described and dilated on after every new phase of intellectual growth in the three young minds had been stated and reviewed hubert stamford relinquished his charge of windigo and departed for the metropolis on his long-expected holiday not without tears shed by his female relatives did he leave windigo that true and sacred home in every sense of the word a family abiding place consecrated by fervent unselfish love which had grown and deepened since childhood's hour with every opening year how could they think of without a sudden pang of the possibility of an accident of one of the everyday mischances in this age of rushing resistless forces harnessed to the car of man's feverish need depriving them forever of the sight of that pleasant face those frank kind eyes that manly form such might happen had happened therefore there were averted heads fast falling tears as the signal sounded and the punctual pitiless steam giant bore away the hope of wendigo from the little platform at Muramah. poor dear hubert said linda sneezing violently then and then wiping her eyes it seems ridiculous to cry when he's going away to enjoy himself so much and deserves it so well but somehow I'll, one can't help it there is a great relief in tears i think they are specially adapted to the feminine temperament a nice comforting sort of protest against circumstances dear me how lonely we shall be to-night i really believe father was afraid he would give way too as nurse allen used to say said laura and that was the reason he declined to come never mind we shall have a telegram to-morrow he must have been much more lonely when we departed fancy you or me at home linda and all the rest of the family away when hubert stamford had got over the first feeling of parting with those whom he loved better than his own life the change of place and scene which the fast-speeding mail-train rapidly furnished 
commenced to raise his youthful spirits after all ce n'est que le premier pas qui coûte ah but that first step some people never can accomplish it for things good as well as evil and a whole world of delights and dangers remain unexplored in hubert stamford's case the initiatory stage was now accomplished the journey more or less eventful to home-keeping youths the first really accredited visit to the metropolis since his manhood with all things made easy for him was now about to take place imagination commenced to conjure up the various wonders and witcheries which he was about to encounter as well as the campaign of business which he hoped to plan out and engineer definitely if not finally much revolving these pleasing and in a sense profitable thoughts the night became reasonably far advanced it then occurred to him that as he intended to have a long day before him in sydney he might as well prepare for it by an orthodox allowance of sleep so commending himself and those never forgotten idols of his heart to the mercy of the all-wise all-seeing father of this wondrous world he wrapped himself in his rug and fell asleep when he awoke the train was speeding down the long incline which divides the mountain world of rock and dell-drifted peak and alpine summit from the lowlands of the nepian river a few more miles another hour farms and homesteadings orangeries and orchards vineyards and cornfields alternated with wide pastures dank with river fogs and morning dew darksome jungles of eucalyptus which the axe of the woodman had as yet spared yet another terminus suburbs smoke a distant view of the great sea a turmoil of railway sheds carriages tramcars and cabs sydney comfortably established at batty's hotel to the management of which he had taken the trouble to telegraph for a room and received with that pleasing welcome according to the guest who is known to spend liberally and pay promptly hubert found the situation as he surveyed the harbour from the balcony with after-breakfast feelings to be one of measureless content mingled with sanguine anticipation oh precious springtime of life blessed reflex of the golden days of arcady what might we not have done with thy celestial hours strewn with diamonds and rubies more precious than the fabled valley of the arabian voyager had we but have divined their value for how much is it now too late the side bearer slow passionless pitiless has passed on the irrevocable winged hours have fled opportunity fleet nymph with haunting eyes and shining hair has disappeared in the recesses of the charmed forest and we gazing hopelessly on the shore of life's ocean hear from afar the hollow murmur of the maelstrom of fate the rhythmic cadence of the tideless waves of eternity hubert stamford more fortunate had all the world before him moreover nothing to do but elect with the aid of a sufficiency of cash leisure and introductions to what particular pleasures he should devote the cheerful day he revolved in his mind several kinds of entertainments of which he would like to partake but finally resolved to present himself at the office of the austral agency company having a great desire to see the wonderful barrington hope of whom he had heard so much as all stood sound him as to a queensland stock speculation he would leave a card for mr grandison at his club if no engagement turned up he would take a steamer to manly beach and afterwards go to the theatre having mapped out the day to his satisfaction hubert betook himself to the austral agency company's offices by the splendour of which he was much struck and sent in his card he was not suffered to remain long in the outer office but was promptly ushered into the manager's room and confronted with the head of the department in person doubtless it was a mutual pleasure hubert was impressed with the autocrat's appearance the manner as well as the reserve of power which in every word and gesture barrington hope displayed the latter on the other hand did full justice to the bold sincere countenance the manly muscular figure of his younger visitor reading between the lines he saw there written quenchless energy and love of adventure yet shrewd forecast 
this youngster is not like other men mr hope said to himself after the first direct searching gaze he only wants opportunity encouragement and the backing up of capital to become a successful speculator he has enterprise undying pluck persistent energy and still sufficient apprehensiveness to shield him from disaster we must send him along he will do well for himself and the company his complexion and features are different but how like he is to his sister much of this he may have thought but merely said mr hubert stanford i am sincerely glad to make your acquaintance having had the pleasure of knowing your family i was really anxious to meet you i venture to predict that we shall become friends and allies i trust you left all well at windigill and that the season continues favourable perfectly well thank you said hubert my father desired to be particularly remembered to you my sisters have not yet left off describing their pleasant visit to sydney the season is a trifle dry but otherwise everything that can be desired thanks very much tell your sisters when you write that a great melancholy fell upon me when they left we had been so much together in town fortunately for me i have been waiting for an opportunity to thank you for the assistance you gave us at a very critical time said hubert my father has i dare say told you all we thought about it but i always determined to speak for myself on the subject it was a speculation a purely business risk which i undertook replied mr hope i told your father so at the time that it has resulted so favourably is of course most satisfactory i see your point all the same it was more than fortunate for us and for windigan that you happened to take that precise commercial risk at that particular time it is besides more agreeable to work financially with some people than others and now will you come and lunch with me so that we may have a talk i am really sorry said mr hope looking at his watch but shall not have five minutes to spare till five o'clock when i should like to consult you on a business matter if afterwards you will dine with me at the club at seven sharp i will talk as much as you like that will do as well indeed better said hubert as the day will be over which is a great advantage if one is to enjoy oneself i have a call or two to make so adieu for the present making a direct point for the club which mr grandison ornamented hubert was fortunate in discovering that gentleman just emerging from the stranger's room with an elderly gentleman whom hubert recognized as colonel dacre how are you hubert my boy said grandison what a man you've grown nothing like bush air father quite well mother and the girls glad to hear it let me introduce you to colonel dacre soon to be a neighbor of yours at wantabalry i'm very sorry for it blurted out hubert that is in one sense as i told colonel dacre before i said then and think now that he made a bad bargain that apart i am of course delighted to hear that he is coming with his family to live so near us oh indeed i didn't know you had met before the colonel bowed and looking slightly embarrassed for a veteran before so youthful a soldier as hubert said i ought to thank mr stamford and his father for their sincere and kindly advice about my purchase i did not take it wholly and indeed acted on my own judgment and that of other friends in buying want of balry but i shall always feel grateful for their well-meant counsel why how is this hubert said mr grandison with an important air you seem to have been very decided on the subject my friend bartardale under whose financial advice colonel dacre acted says he is credibly informed that it is a most paying purchase and dealerson says it is the best bargain of the day for him no doubt but dealerson is a liar and a rogue said hubert bluntly i will tell him so to his face if ever i meet him as for Borkdale, he keeps dealerson's account and perhaps may not wish to offend a good customer the colonel has been deceived and robbed that's all and having said enough perhaps more than is polite i shall not speak another word about the affair except to assure colonel dacre that all windigill is at his service in the way of naval assistance 
thanks very much said the colonel looking rather crestfallen but have you heard hubert felt quite ashamed of his savage sentence as he remarked the old gentleman's humility of tone the price i have sold the fat sheep at no replied hubert i can't say that i have but assuming that the wool does as well you are still in dangerous position with an overcrowded run however i sincerely trust that it may be otherwise and so do i said mr grandison but you've done your duty my boy and providence must do the rest colonel dacre is coming to lunch with me here's the phaeton jump in and you will see mrs grandison and josie besides another young lady that you haven't before met i asked mr hope to lunch said hubert but as he can't come i am free and so if colonel dacre isn't offended by my plain speaking i shall be most happy at luncheon mrs grandison appeared with the fair josie who welcomed hubert so warmly that he began to think he was mistaken in the opinion he had previously formed of both these ladies certainly in his boyhood they had expressed remarkably little interest in his welfare but being slow to think evil he took himself severely to task and decided that mrs grandison was a warm-hearted matron and josie a very attractive-looking girl at that moment a young lady entered the room and apologized to mrs grandison in so sweet a voice and with so much natural grace of manner for being late that his too susceptible heart was immediately led captive miss josie's charms receded to a register below zero where they remained as unalterably fixed as the set fare in an aneroid barometer in a drought allow me to introduce our cousin mr hubert stamford said the elder lady miss Duck, i think you are to be neighbours in the bush i am happy to meet mr stamford said the young lady bestowing a gaze on hubert so honest kindly and yet questioning that his subjection was complete though from what papa tells me it is not his fault that we are not in some other district i was acting against my own interest against all our interests hubert said rather nervously believe me that the whole family were most anxious to have you as neighbours so you must give me credit for honesty of intention i shall never doubt that from all i hear said miss dagger papa is rather sanguine i am afraid and perhaps i am not sufficiently so said hubert it's all over now let us find a pleasanter subject when do you think of going up oh next week at farthest are we not papa the colonel nodded i am enthusiastically fond of the country i hear there is such a nice cottage quite a pretty garden a flowing stream a mountain cows and pigs and chickens a fair library in fact almost an english home you'll admit that i hope mr stamford i'll admit anything said hubert the homestead's the best in the district my mother and sisters will be charmed to put you au fait in all matters of bush housekeeping and now josie are you going to the opera on thursday night and would you like a cavalier we were thinking of it said she mother was doubtful and father doesn't care about opera if you can get some one else i have no doubt mrs stopford would be glad to act as chaperon and miss dagry and i would go if she would like it oh above all things said that young lady i am always ready to hear opera and i hear you have a very good company here i was stupid enough when i left england to think i should never hear italian opera again i feel ashamed we are not quite barbarians nor yet copper-coloured said josie though i am afraid we sydney girls can't boast of our complexions i am quite ready to make recantation of all my airs said miss Deck. i suppose it need not be done publicly in a white sheet i am divided between that and writing to the times i believe you will make the best bush woman possible said the colonel with an admiring glance only we both have so much to unlearn i didn't expect to see a room like this for instance or such appointments he continued raising a glass of claret pensively to his lips it's rather a bad thing for us pappy as we have to live in the real bush don't you think we must forget it all as soon as possible it won't make the least difference to you my dear said mrs grandison if you had seen 
you were sisters here you would have been well astonished to see such girls come out of the bush for some reasons i begin really to think it would be better for all of us to live there here she glanced reflectively at josie who looked scarcely as self-possessed as usual i shall not say another word about bush matters said hubert they will keep when miss dacre comes up she will judge for herself if my opinion is requested i shall be happy to give it but shall not volunteer advice will your brother travel up with you miss dacre willoughby went to stay a few days with a ship friend who lives near penrith i think it is but he is quite as enthusiastic as i am about beginning life in earnest he will be in town again on friday come and dine with us on saturday then hubert said mrs grandison and i'll ask mr hope and one or two of your rude bush pioneers josie can't you get a couple of young ladies for hubert's benefit and to show mr dacre i don't think hubert wants any more young ladies said josie mischievously but i'll ask the flemington girls to come in one of them plays marvellously and the other sings her voice is very like paripas End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of plain living by rolf boulderlin this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 13 The dinner was a success, the party to the opera having gone off without a drawback to the unbroken joyousness of the affair. The Mrs. Flemington came and performed such musical feats as were expected of them, and Miss Dacre admitted that she had not heard a voice unprofessional for years to equal May Flemington's. She wondered, indeed, what she could have been thinking of to imagine that when she came to Australia all artistic luxuries were to be banished from her thoughts. "'The fact is,' she said, "'we are frightfully narrow and prejudiced in England. We know a great deal about France, Germany, and the continent, generally, because we are always running backwards and forwards. But of our own countrymen in Australia and New Zealand we know next to nothing.' i was going to say as little as about timbuktu but we do really know something about africa because the missionaries tell us and we have returned evangelists from boribula ga even from fiji and new zealand but of australia we know nothing when you go home again miss dacre said hubert you will be able to do battle for us i see we must make you agent-general or ambassadors if any such post is vacant i am sure you will do us justice indeed i shall but i feel ashamed of the ludicrous notions which i brought out with me no one would think of going down to yorkshire and saying i suppose you have nothing newer in songs than the days when we went gypsying or asking the edinburgh people if they had ever seen a bicycle but really men and women who have had advantages as they are called do come here five weeks from england and expect to see you living a sort of fenimore cooper life cutting down trees trailing your enemies and sleeping in wigwams or huts only once removed perhaps a portion of this is natural enough said hubert we are a long way from town no it is not natural said miss dacre because have not so many of our friends come out for generations past and then for us to think that their sons and daughters were to grow up as clods and belles sauvages it will all come right in time said hubert it doesn't hurt us if it pleases them always accepting people here he bowed whom we don't want to have wrong impressions about us wait till you get fairly settled at montebori miss dacre and you'll lose a few more illusions oh but i don't want to lose all of them replied the young lady some of them are so nice that i want to retain them in full freshness i am going to keep pigs and poultry and send wonderful hams to england to show our people what we can do i am going to be a great walker and write letters about my impressions to the magazines i am sure they will do good then i shall have a good collection of books and grow quite learned 
besides making myself acquainted with all the people round about and doing good among the poor i am certain there is a great field for an energetic person like myself true replied hubert reflectively australians are rarely energetic and your programme is excellent i fully agree with all your plans and ideas but i am only afraid there may be difficulties in the way of carrying them out you really are most disappointing people you colonists here hubert held up his finger warningly oh i forgot i am not to call you colonists but to talk to you as if you were like everybody else is not that so well but you do disappoint me there is an air of guarded toleration or mild disapproval which i observe among all of you when i begin to talk of carrying out reforms you are very polite i admit but tell me now why should i not surely one does not come all this way to do only what every one else does josie laughed hubert looked sympathetic but did not offer an explanation then mrs grandison took up the running my dear you are quite right in wishing to do everything in your power in the way of good it is what every girl ought to strive after it would keep them out of mischief and so on but where you english people when you first come out not afterwards differ a little from us is that you are all going to set us benighted colonists right and to improve us in a great many ways you say i only want to do my duty just as one would do in england but the idea is that you can improve things ever so much well perhaps there may be a feeling that a good deal appears to be left undone but the intention is to do our duty in that state of life etc quite true assented mrs grandison but remember what you said that so many of the best people of the old country had come out here may not they and their children have worked to some purpose with results like the miss flemington's music and singing well that does seem probable but a great deal remains undone you must admit that surely i am afraid many of us are not up to the mark in our duties but the same kind of persons would perhaps have done no better in an english county but i could show you people who pass their lives in doing good who hardly do anything else in fact and for what is not done said hubert who had been regarding mrs grandison's defence of australian institutions with a slightly surprised air there is commonly some reason though not visible to a newly arrived young lady like yourself thank you mr stamford but why did you not call me a new chum while you were about it i know you all look down on us we do not call ladies new chums said hubert gravely bowing slightly at the same time and i really must decline any more passages of arms about my native land i hope you will like it and us too on further acquaintance i will hand you over to my sisters who will argue the point with you at any length and if you can inoculate each other with your different opinions it will be mutually advantageous with which diplomatic recommendation mr hubert stamford looked at his watch and bowed himself out i mustn't be late for this appointment with barrington hope he told himself it is important enough and though i could sit and argue with that nice fresh enthusiastic miss dacre all day yet business is business from which latter proverb it may be inferred that mr stamford jr although by no means averse to the proper and gallant attendance upon ladies which every man of his age should hold to be a part of his nightly devoir was yet in the main a practical youth likely in the long run to win his spurs in the modern turning of pastoral commerce after thinking over the points of the coming conference he signalled to a handsome cabby and was taken up by that modern benefactor of the late the imprudent and the unlucky and whirled swiftly to the offices of the austral agency company here mr hope had arranged to meet a mr delamere who was anxious to acquire a pastoral property in the new country queensland just opened and in every man's mouth this gentleman had but lately arrived from england in a kind of way he was consigned to the company by one of the english directors who happened to be his uncle mr delamere senior 
had known the colonies in former years and being fully aware that high hope and lofty purpose even when combined with an available capital do not altogether make up for total inexperience of all australian pastoral matters had besought the manager of the melbourne branch of the austral agency company to advise the cadet of his house i am aware my dear thornton he wrote that in a general way it is thought better that a newly arrived young gentleman should work out his own destiny in australia that after repeated falls and losses he learns to run alone and may be trusted henceforth to move more circumspectly than if he had been shepherded from the first but i dissent from this theory the falls are often serious after some losses there is nothing left i prefer a partner such a one as i had myself thirty years ago if possible there ought to be a few well-bred youngsters knocking about who know everything that can be known about stations and stock but are held back for want of capital such a one could supply the experience while frank delamere would find the capital the old joke used to be that in two or three years the new arrival had acquired all the experience and the colonist all the cash this reads smartly but is false enough like many bon mots both in the old world and the new where was there ever a better man than my old overseer jock maxwell afterwards a partner and now deservedly pastoral magnate he could work twice as hard as i ever did he knew station life ab ovo he was honest to a fault he but i always prose when i get on this topic it is enough to say that i had sufficient sense to form this estimate of his character and act upon it whereby as captain cuttle has it i am now writing from grayland manor near glastonbury thorn instead of being a white slave in a counting-house or the half-pay pauper generally known as a retired military officer therefore a convenient if illogical expression i charge you to procure a good steady partner for frank who will see that his ten thousand perhaps more if need be is not wasted or pillaged before he cuts his wisdom teeth as a bushman draw at sight when investments are made with your consent yours ever sincerely robert delamere this was the business on which the three men met on this day at the austral agency company's office before this momentous interview a certain amount of preliminary work had been done letters and wires had circulated freely between windagall sydney and melbourne from which city the newly fledged intending purchaser had recently been summoned permission had been reluctantly granted by mr stanford who foresaw years of separation from the son and heir who had never cost him an anxious moment as to his conduct the affair was tearfully discussed by mrs stanford and the girls who thought life would no longer be worth living at windagall when hubert's merry voice and unfailing good spirits were withdrawn why do people want to change and alter things to go away and bring sorrow and misery and destruction no i mean desolation on those they love demanded linda and we are all so happy here it seems cruel of hubert to take it into his head to go to queensland all among blacks and fever and sunstroke and everything here she got to the end of her list of probable disasters and though sensible that her climax was not effective was fain to conclude don't you think it's too bad mother we shall feel dear hubert's absence deeply bitterly i grant said the fond mother but he is animated by the very natural desire of all high-spirited young men to improve the fortunes of the family and to distinguish himself in a career which is open to all but the danger mother said laura in a low voice you remember poor young talbot whom the blacks killed last month and mr haldane who died of fever suppose oh suppose suppose the house fell down and killed us all said mr stamford rather testily for the purpose of hiding his own inward disquiet which though not expressed was as deeply felt as that of his wife and daughters it's no use talking in that way as if a young man had never gone out into the world before boys go to sea and into the army every day of the year people must make up their minds to it 
it is a grand opportunity mr hope says and may not occur again i shall hate mr hope said linda if he has induced hubert to go into this speculation along with some one no one knows into a country which half the people it seems to me never come back from but i suppose those mercantile men don't care you mustn't be unjust linda interposed laura whatever mr hope has done has been in hubert's interest we may feel sure he has always been most friendly to the family and you must remember that hubert has been lately always pining to go to queensland and talking about wasting his life here in this old settled district what's the use of being miserable if you can't be unjust to some one retorted linda if you felt as deeply as i do laura you wouldn't talk in that cold-blooded way i can see the whole thing mr hope and his company are anxious to establish a great station property out in queensland or kimberley or king george's sound or wherever it is and they have pitched upon poor hubert as a likely victim for the sacrifice that's the whole thing they're regular monarchs and mr hope is the officiating high priest nothing else i wonder how he'd look with a garland of oak leaves like the druid in norma here linda's feelings brought to a climax by a smile which she detected on laura's countenance at her melange of metaphors became too much for her and pressing her handkerchief to her eyes she retreated to her bedroom all the high contracting parties having sent in unqualified assent it but remained for mr hope to introduce the young men to each other the representatives of the parent land and that greater britain which has now in the south and west attained such vast proportions also to reduce to writing the terms of an agreement by which the two men bound themselves to work together for their joint benefit as graziers explorers stock and station proprietors for the fixed term of five years mr delamere was to place to the credit of the new firm of delamere and stamford the sum of ten thousand pounds which would be amply sufficient for the purchase of stock the taking up or even securing at second hand the requisite areas of crown lands in new or partially settled country hubert stamford on the other hand did agree and contract to personally manage and conduct the details of the joint concern to superintend the management of stock the hiring of station hands the purchase of stores and whatever work either of exploration travel or management might be found necessary for which he was in consideration of such personal knowledge and experience of the management of stock and stations by him acquired to be placed and held to be the possessor of one-third share of the said property and of the profits of said stock and stations these provisions and declarations were embodied in an agreement which was drawn up by the company's solicitor and submitted by him to mr worthington for inspection and approval that gentleman as instructed wrote to mr stamford senior who it would appear made some subsequent communication to him inasmuch as mr hope received a letter signed worthington wardell and company which briefly but clearly stated that his friend and client mr stamford of windigill approved generally of the terms of the agreement entered into by his son and mr delamere and that he was quite willing that he should enter into such an arrangement and that mr hope of the austral agency company had his full confidence and trust but that he desired his son to place a proportionate sum of ready money to the credit of the firm and not to enter it wholly upon the outlay of another and therefore that he had placed in mr worthington's hands securities to the value of five thousand pounds which sum they were ready to pay over on mr hope's order to that effect upon the receipt of this letter mr hope at once proposed that the share of the profits to which mr hubert stamford was entitled under the agreement should be altered to one half inasmuch as his superior knowledge and experience would be in value to the interest of the other moiety of the ten thousand pounds to be advanced by mr delamere and would thus equalize matters this was at once agreed to on the part of mr delamere and the melbourne manager of the company acting in his interests upon which the agreement was signed sealed and delivered 
nothing now remained but for hubert to pay a farewell visit to windigo for the purpose of settling up what personal business he might have to take leave of the family and then to journey into a far country after the fashion of the princes prodigals and younger sons of historic ages place and time being appointed for the newly joined partners to meet and take ship for their destination hubert stamford commenced all requisite preparation for a start homewards he had no further heart for the pleasures of sydney the ordinary distractions of a young man palled upon him he felt like a general whose army is about to march for the imminent battle like a soldier picked for a forlorn hope or an advanced guard the meaner pleasures revolted him balls and picnics theatres and concerts were but the straws and debris of life's ocean the argosy which carried his fortunes was about to sail with canvas spread and streamers flying would she return gold-laden or would the cold ocean engulf her as so many other fair barks which youth at the prow and pleasure at the helm had sailed away through the engines equar and returned never more was it to be so with him might it be a proved success a wider experience with the praise of all men the joyful tears and triumph of those who loved him or that other thing who could tell he could only resolve to do and to dare worthily whatever might befall for their dear sakes miss dacre with her father and brother had left town for montabalry being anxious to be settled in their new abode the colonel distrusting more deeply day by day the wisdom of his purchase had become restless and uneasy he wanted to see with his own eyes how things went on and to justify himself if possible for the investment at which more than one disinterested critic had shaken his head willoughby dacre an ardent inexperienced youngster who thought australian squatter life made up wholly of galloping about on horseback and lying under shady trees eating tropical fruits was also impatient to be in the thick of the half arab life he pictured to himself rosalind dacre though the chief doubter and dissentient was yet eager to see with her own eyes this land of promise which was according to hubert to fail so woefully in performance and also to put in practice her own ideas of the gentle life as possible in australia at the same time to comfort her father and aid in the household management for all these reasons the dacre family had departed and hubert calling at their hotel found to his surprise and slight dissatisfaction that they had gone the day before a note of the colonel's alone remaining and souvenir in which he thanked him for his well-meant valuable advice and trusted they would meet in the neighbourhood of their respective stations for some unexplained reason hubert read this trivial note several times and then tearing it up in a reflective manner walked slowly towards his own hostelry when do you think of leaving hubert said mr hope as they were talking over districts and markets land laws and tenures railways and syndicates all more or less bearing on the great pastoral central idea when shall you go home on friday i think i am getting tired of town and everything is fully arranged everything is settled that needs settling and nothing more can be done until you young men manage to get pretty far back and make your first deal in new country it's a gloriously exciting adventurous kind of life this starting to take up new country i often wish i'd taken to it myself in youth instead of this branch of the business living in town seems a pleasant life enough said hubert you have all sorts of things that we people in the bush have to do without and we need them all said the older man this office life is one eternal grind month after month year after year but i don't wish to complain i suppose all men get hyped sometimes i never do laughed hubert the day's never long enough for me but i suppose i soon should if i lived all the year round in town it's been so much in the open air that saves one but what don't you clear out to windy gill for a change come home with me the governor and my mother are always expecting you to send them word you're coming i wish to heaven i could said the man of the city 
looking enviously at hubert's cheery countenance and unworn features and but i can't find the time at present however i promise to turn up at Muramaw. isn't that your railway town some time before christmas i shall count the days till i can i assure you i shall be away then i am sorry to say said hubert i should like to have taken you all over the place there are one or two decent views and rides and drives no end however the girls and the young brothers know them as well as i do you must get them to do the honours oh i forgot too you can drive them over to the daggers but you mustn't put it off too long still they can't be ruined within a year of eighteen months anyhow and perhaps not then said mr hope with a smile friends might intervene judiciously you know it won't be mr dealerson's fault if they pull through however no hang him however there must be dealersons in the world i suppose they act as a kind of foil to honest men and serve as transparencies to show roguery in all its glory well good-bye till then we may meet before Denimere and i start for the never never country when hubert stamford beheld his sisters and his younger brother who had driven to Muramaw to meet him he felt more like a stranger and pilgrim than he ever expected to feel in that familiar spot he was there with them but not of them as it were he was to stay a month or so at windigo only a month at the dear old place where he had lived ever since he could remember anything he was to go over all the familiar scenes once more and then to leave it certainly for years perhaps forever after the first warm greeting the girls looked inquiringly at him the tears came into laura's eyes oh how happy we are to see you our own dear hubert but to think you are going away so soon nearly breaks my heart she said he looks wonderfully well town life not too much always refines people said linda with an air of tender criticism but i think there's a hard look about his eyes i suppose it's making up his mind to this grand new speculation you see exactly the same hubert stamford that went away you little analyzing duffer but is it my fault that i have had to move with the rest of the world do you want me to stay at home and become a superior sort of cockatoo and are you and laura if it is to come to that prepared to remain at windygill for the rest of your lives i wish i could groaned laura but as you say we must move with the rest of the world still these separations are heartbreaking you needn't mind us overmuch dear but we are women remember and you must let us have our cry out it does us good and relieves the overcharged heart very well i consent but you must manage it all to-day to-morrow must be sunshine and only blue sky appear till i depart but there's a whole month or more yet think of that we can be ever so happy all that time now to change the subject have you seen anything of the dacres that means miss dacre i suppose said linda oh yes we went to call almost directly we heard they were up said we thought they might want something that was how we described our curiosity and what did you think of her she's a dear sweet creature and laura and i have agreed that if you don't fall in love with her your taste isn't as good as we believed it to be she's very nice said hubert with society nonchalance but i've got something else to do besides falling in love for the next three or four years besides she mightn't condescend to a humble colonist like me but tell me laura what was there about her that you were struck with chiefly several things said laura reflectively she is a high caste cultured girl in every respect though she is so fresh and natural and plain in all her ways that people who are always looking out for the airs and graces of the lady clara ver de ver species might be disappointed in her all that i can understand and generally agree with said hubert what's next she is awfully energetic continued laura of course there are plenty of girls in this country that are but she never seems to have any notion of repose from the time she gets up which is early till bedtime 
she reads and writes and does her housekeeping and walks and rides and drives and what she calls visits the poor oh there is quite a good story about that which i must tell you all with unvarying industry she is a newly imported broom said hubert and naturally sweeps with effectiveness it will slow down a little with time but it's a fault on the right side tell us the story laura dear End of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of Plain Living by Rolf Boulderwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Fourteen. Well, said Laura, putting on a Scheherazade expression of countenance, it appears that Miss Dacre, having been used to be good to the poor of the village near where they lived in England, could not get on without them much to her surprise she found them scarce in the neighbourhood of montabalry mr dealerson did not believe in poor people and generally fed out blocked or bought out small holders at length in one of her rides she came upon an old couple living in a miserable hut the man feeble and half blind both apparently destitute their one little girl was barefooted and in rags they told a pitiful story of having been deceived in the matter of a free selection which of course she couldn't understand and deserted by their children charmed by their evident poverty and artless expressions of gratitude she gave them what silver she had and promised them employment our intention was good said hubert i can guess the kind of people they were but it speaks well for her kindness of heart nothing could be kinder i am sure but i grieve to say she rushed into a declamation she confessed about the hardness of colonist hearts who would let so deserving a couple almost die of hunger in a land of plenty as to that said hubert very few people suffer from hunger in australia except when they decline work even then they manage to live on their friends how did the story end well she formed a plan for persuading these delightful poor to migrate to wantabalry where they were to be fed and furnished with light work fortunately for her peace of mind when she told her father and brother they made inquiries among the neighbours then they found out that the old man was one of the most artful and successful sheep stealers in the district and had even been tried for graver crimes the money she gave him he invested in rum under the influence of which he beat his wife and turned his little daughter out of doors and what effect has this discovery of her philanthropy for of course it was old jimmy doolan a man the police have been trying to get hold of for years as slippery as a fox and as savage as a wolf she had to recant to admit that perhaps on the whole the characters of people were known and appreciated by those amongst whom they lived still she said there was a want of systematic benevolence in the neighbourhood and that she would rather be deceived occasionally than sink into a state of cold indifferentism towards her fellow-creatures it's really quite pathetic said hubert one feels drawn towards a girl of such tendencies as if she were a nice child it seems hard that a few years of colonial experience should deprive her of such tender illusions i don't think anything will tone her down into anything uninteresting if you mean that said linda she has too much high principle and refinement she will learn to act judiciously in time as mother does for instance said laura she is always bestowing father's substance upon some poor creature or other but she finds out the right sort of people and the proper when and where before long a return visit occurred from wantabry from which place willoughby dagger drove his sister to windahill about a week after the conversation above recorded the brother and sister made their appearance in a vehicle of unpretending appearance being indeed no other than the spring-cart which was given in ostentatiously by mr dealerson 
along with furniture and other station requisites willoughby having managed to rig up leading harness had accomplished a tandem with two of the best-looking horses on the station so that the turnout was not wholly plebeian much mutual delight was expressed by the girls and various experiences interchanged which had occurred since their last meeting the young men went off together to put up the horses and took advantage of the opportunity to have a little sheep talk how are you getting on so far said hubert shaking down a bit i suppose does your father approve of bush life oh he finds himself most comfortable answered willoughby he has a snug morning room with a fire and plenty of books and papers he says he never expected to enjoy himself so much in the bush he takes a great interest in the garden too the fruit trees and vines are really something to look at i don't doubt it said hubert the house and grounds stabling and out offices are about the best in the district well i hope you'll all live there many years to enjoy them i hope so too said willoughby but excuse me if i say that you don't seem to expect it now why is it that as everything is so good in its way the sheep well bred everybody says and looking so well now that you regard the investment as a bad one you are not alone in that opinion either though the other neighbours don't speak so honestly my prophecy of evil may not come off after all this is an uncertain country as to weather and weather with us is everything but if the rain holds off you'll see what i mean you have about two-thirds too many sheep on the run that is all what can we do well nothing just at present in a general way sell off surplus stock as soon as you can do so profitably but in a dry season everybody wishes to sell and few care to buy except at the lowest prices however i'll put you up to the likeliest dodges when the time comes thanks very much i can't help feeling anxious from time to time when i think that our all is embarked in this undertaking i thought it was so safe and solid and never dreamed that there could be such a swindle worked when all looked fair outside the governor was rash i must say it's a way of his but we must fight our way out of the scrape now we're in it that's the only thing to be done and not to lose heart there are always chances and changes with stock in australia fortunes are always to be made and to be lost it seems you are just going to invest in queensland i hear isn't that a long way off it's never too far off if the country's good said hubert runs are cheap there now but they are always rising in value i intend to send a lot of our windigill sheep out there as soon as we get settled if we hadn't spent all our money said the young englishman regretfully we might have bought a run there too however it can't be helped as we said before i shall be glad to hear from you when you get there any information i can give shall be at your service as well as all possible assistance said hubert warmly always depend on that but it's early in the day to talk about such things we shall see more clearly what to do as the occasion arises and now we had better join the ladies it was settled after a rather animated discussion that the visitors were not to return to wantabalry that night in vain they pleaded household tasks station exigencies the anxiety which colonel dacre was certain to experience at their absence all these reasons were treated as mere excuses there couldn't be much housekeeping for one person especially as they had for a wonder a decent cook the station could wait the less work done among the sheep at present the better while it was extracted in cross-examination that colonel dacre had told them that if they did not return he should conclude they had stayed at windigo so the truce was definitely arranged 
the horses turned into the river paddock the young men went out for a drive in hubert's buggy to inspect a dam at the back concerning which young dacre had expressed some interest while the three girls after a ramble in the garden settled down to a good steady afternoon's needlework and an exhaustive discussion of bush life and australian matters generally what a famous light running easy track this is of yours said dacre as they spun over the smooth sandy bush track whalebone and whipcord an exceptionally fast pair of horses slipping along at half speed yes said hubert it's the best thing of the kind that's made i believe i bought this to take out with me to the new country i think it is economical to have a vehicle of this sort there are many bits of station work that a buggy comes in for and you save horseflesh i wonder you don't get one for your sister well we found the tax cart at the station and rosalind's such a terrific economist that she wouldn't hear of us buying a carriage as she calls it for her but i really must go in for a buggy if it's only on the governor's account he's not so young as he was and riding knocks him about i can see but how fast your horses are i didn't think australian horses went in for trotting much none of ours do australian horses and men and women too as i think i have mentioned before remarked hubert with suspicious mildness resemble those in other parts of the world though the contrary is asserted some are good others bad some of them the horses i now allude to can trot others cannot this pair for instance here he tightened his reins and in some imperceptible fashion gave a signal which they answered to by putting up their heads and bursting into sixteen miles an hour can do a mile in very fair time for non-professionals so i see replied the young englishman i wish i was not so hasty in forming impressions however i shall be cured of that in time but it is awfully trying to hold your tongue when everything is new and exciting and to talk cautiously is foreign to the dark of nature experientia does it as we used to say at school laughed hubert you'll be chopping new arrivals in a couple of years yourself the regulation period is about that time and i don't think you'll take so long as some people that's a compliment to my general intelligence said dacre i suppose i ought to feel grateful but one can't help a slight feeling of soreness you know that after being regularly educated for a colonial life as i was and coached in all the necessary carpentering blacksmithing agriculture and so on i should find myself so utterly ignorant and helpless here come come said hubert you do yourself injustice it won't take more than a year to make a smart bushman of you i can see but i suppose it's something like going into a strange country to hunt you remember that when mr sawyer went to the shires he felt under a disadvantage at first yes but you wouldn't or mackintosh or any of the other fellows i've seen that's what makes me so savage with myself you know your way about people wouldn't discover unless you told them that you have lived in england all your days while we fellows who came out here certainly thinking ourselves as good all round as any one we were likely to find are always exposing our ignorance getting laughed at or taken in and are marked for immigrants and tyros as far as we can be seen i observe your point and it is a little aggravating replied hubert but after all it is a compliment to our mother country that we make it our business from childhood to know all about her history and traditions manners and customs from a thousand accurate chronicles our usages modelled upon hers and and religiously handed down by our parents are identical or as nearly so as we can make them but our country and our trifling yet marked departures from english standards 
have found few close observers accurate descriptions and fewer narrators still there is hardly any way of getting acquainted with us except by actual experience it looks like it assented his friend reluctantly but i mourn over the fond illusions rosalind and i are doomed to lose before we complete our apprenticeship hope we may acquire others not less satisfactory the outlook of wantabalry at present might be brighter too if what you told my father comes to pass it may not happen after all or it may be parried and averted all manner of chances may arise in your interest so do not think of desponding said hubert one of the special characteristics of australians is that they never despair never know when they are beat in fact said dacre with a returning smile well that is a genuine english trait at any rate so i must support the credit of my country the dam was inspected and the principle of the bywash explained to dacre who showed an aptitude and readiness to comprehend the necessary detail which favorably impressed hubert the free horses pulled more on the homeward track than coming out and elicited high commendation they certainly are superb goers and this is the poetry of motion dacre exclaimed as sending out their eight legs as if they belonged to one horse the well-matched pair made the light yet strong vehicle spin over the level road with an ease and velocity which no two-wheeled trap ever approached i shall be unhappy till i set up a buggy and a pair of trotters all the good resolutions to spend nothing that could be helped made at the beginning of the month notwithstanding it's false economy to go without a buggy said hubert tell your father i said so and that is easily demonstrable it saves horse-flesh enables you to carry feed in a dry season and has other useful and agreeable qualities the tea for which they were just in time to dress was an agreeable not to say hilarious meal the miss stamfords it would seem had been admitting their visitor into all kinds of occult mysteries of domestic management how they arranged when they were short of a servant without a cook or a housemaid or indeed as occasionally happened though not for any protracted period when they had no servant at all miss dacre was astonished to find what a complete and practical knowledge these soft-appearing graceful damsels displayed with many branches of household lore and how many hints they were able to offer for her acceptance all of which tended to lighten the labours of bush housekeeping which she had already found burdensome from mrs stamford on opening the relief question it was discovered that she had various humble friends and pensioners all of whom she helped after a fashion which encouraged them to be industrious and self-supporting others again received advice in the management of their families the treatment of their children the choice of trades for their sons and of service for their daughters in a number of humble homes and by all the neighboring settlers this gentle low-voiced woman was regarded as the chatelaine of the manor the good angel of the neighborhood the personage to whom all deferred whose virtues all imitated at a distance and whom to disappoint or to pain was a matter more deeply regretted than the actual shortcoming which had led to reproof and all this work had been done the sensible system of true christian benevolence and aid was in full flow and operation without one word being said by the agents themselves which gave a hint of the energy contrivance and self-denial manifestly necessary for such results all things were done silently unobtrusively no one spoke of them or seemed to think them other than matters of course this was a phase of colonial life which struck the eager critic of the new land with something like dismay was it possible in this strange country that there might be yet other instances of human love and charity efficiently performed with equally thoroughness and absence of demonstration if so 
Had she not been making herself somewhat ridiculous in assuming hurriedly that there were so many niches in Australian temples sacred to heroic effort which were unfilled before she arrived? In spite of the slight feeling of soreness which the knowledge caused her, the general influence of the symposium, separated as she had been for some weeks from companions of her own sex and social standing, was unusually exhilarating. Her natural genial temperament led her, therefore, to laugh secretly at her own miscalculation and discomfiture as a very good and choice joke indeed. However, she was less explanatory than her brother had been, preferring inferential admission, after the manner of her sex. This concession to the wisdom of the colonists exhibited itself in unaffected good humor and affectionate cordiality towards her comparatively recent friends she joined cheerily in all the amusements and occupations of the evening she sang and played praising the performances of the stamford girls and the new songs they had brought back with them from the metropolis she talked flowers and greenhouse with her hostess and had a slight political tilt with mr stamford in all these subjects she exhibited sound teaching as well as a careful theoretical training nothing could be more modest and less assertive than her general manner at the same time that a wider range of thought consequent upon european travel and extended social experience was unconsciously apparent when the windigill family retired for the night mr stamford expressed his opinion to his wife in the sanctity of the matrimonial chamber that he had never met a finer girl in his life before and that he was delighted that they should have such a neighbor while hubert in the smoking-room whither he had retired with his young friend at a late period of the evening may have meditated upon the command to love thy neighbor as thyself but forbore to commit himself by unguarded expression on the next day after a mirthful and consolatory breakfast a trifle later than usual inasmuch as the three maidens sat talking so late that the morning slumbers were prolonged the new neighbors departed fresh expressions of approval and surprise were exhibited by this english guest at the home-baked bread the butter the honey the incomparable home-cured bacon and other triumphs of domestic economy i have enjoyed myself as i never expected to do in the bush she said i thought there would be nothing but devotion to duty stern daughter of the voice of god i never dreamed that so much of the poetry of life was attainable you have taught me a lesson this was in confidence to laura at parting for which i shall be all the better henceforth i am not too old or too conceited to learn at any rate you have nothing very much to learn replied laura we may be mutually advantageous to one another that's all if we make an agreement to put as much friendship and as little ceremony into our intercourse as possible it will not be long before we come over to stay a night at wantabalry before poor hubert starts for queensland i grieve to say and then you must comfort us in our loneliness papa will be quite charmed to see you again if you had heard all the fine things he said about you and linda you would have thought he was looking out for a stepmamma for me but he is purely theoretical in that department i am thankful to say and now good-bye and au revoir the promised visit was made and a renewal of friendship and good offices ratified while the days passed on and the period of hubert's stay with his family drew near to a close the long expected long dreaded day arrived for his departure to the land of adventure and alas of danger it could not be concealed all preparations for the momentous event were at length completed and once more the family assembled at the railway terminus at Muramah to bid farewell to the son and brother the mainstay the hope of windigill deep and unaffected was the grief although outward manifestations were heroically suppressed the warning bell sounded the last adieux were said and as the train moved off relentless irrevocable as fate 
the fair summer day gloomed while the family party drove sadly back to their home from which the sunshine seemed to have been suddenly withdrawn such are the partings in this world of checkered joy and sorrow of light and shadow what prayers were that night offered up to the all-wise dispenser of events for the safety the success the return ah me of the absent wayfarer for him might the fervent sunbeams of the inner deserts be tempered for him might the fierce denizens of the wild be placated for him might the terrible uncertainty of flood and field be guided for good the sisters wept themselves to sleep in each other's arms while the mother's face was sad with unuttered grief and the father's brow grave for many a day after this long-remembered parting but time the healer brought to them as to others the successive stages of calm resignation of renewed hope the post brought tidings of a safely concluded voyage of accomplished land travel at longer intervals of promising investment of successful exploration of permanent settlement in the land of promise of the occupation of pastures new in a region richly gifted by nature and needing but the gradual advance of civilization to be promoted to a profitable and acknowledged status lastly a dispatch arrived of a eminently satisfactory nature from mr barrington hope confirming the latest advices from the wandering heir mr hubert stamford had more than justified all the expectations formed of his energy and business aptitude he had purchased at a comparatively small outlay a lightly stocked and very extensive station upon the border of the settled country leaving mr delamere and a manager of proved ability in charge he had pushed on and after a toilsome journey happily accomplished without accident or loss had discovered and taken up under the queensland regulations which are most favourable to pioneers an immense tract of well-watered pastoral country of the best quality they had received from their correspondents the highest commendation of the value of the property now secured and registered in the name of delamere and stamford windigill downs was a proverb in the mouths of the pioneer squatters of the colony and the laura and linda rivers were duly marked upon the official map at the surveyor-general's office as permanent and important watercourses the austral agency company had the fullest confidence in the prospects of the firm and any reasonable amount of capital would be forthcoming for necessary expenses in stocking up and legally occupying the magnificent tract of pastoral country referred to a private letter accompanied this formally worded official communication informing mr and mrs stamford that the writer proposed to avail himself of their kind invitation to visit windigill at christmas when he would be enabled to utilize a long promised leave of absence for a few weeks it may be imagined but can with difficulty be even sketched faintly with what feelings of joy and gratitude this precious intelligence was received at windigill the happiness too deep for words of the parents the wild ecstatic triumph of the sisters the elation of the servants and station hands which communicated itself to the inhabitants of the surrounding sub-district all of whom were included in the general glory of the event and unfeignedly happy at the news of hubert's brilliant success he deserves it all i never thought but he'd come to good and show em all the way if he got a chance was the general comment of the humbler partisans he was always the poor man's friend was master hubert and now he's going to be at the top of the tree and it's where he ought to be he's a good sort and always was there wasn't a young man within a day's ride of mooramah as was fit to be named in the same day with him oh laura isn't it splendid delicious divine exclaimed linda dancing round her sister and mother with inexpressible delight mr stamford had retired to compose his feelings in the garden oh dear this world's a splendid place of abode after all though i've had terrible doubts lately 
wasn't it fortunate we had strength of mind to let dear darling hubert go though it nearly broke our hearts i was certain some of my heart-strings cracked really i was but now i feel better than ever quite young indeed oh how grateful we ought to be you were not the only one who suffered were you dear said laura looking dreamily into the distance beyond the gleaming river now indeed reduced to nearly its old dimensions our prayer has been answered some day we shall see our hero returning bringing his sheaves with him oh happy day mother what shall we do to relieve our feelings i feel as if i could not bear it unless we did something suppose we drive over to want a ball ring suggested linda father always enjoys a chat with the colonel and that dear good rosamond is always so nice and sympathizing about hubert i wonder if she cares for him the least little bit but she'd die before she'd let anybody know and hubert was so disagreeable he refused to give me the least hint what do you think mother i think nothing at all my dear child in all these matters it is the wisest course neither to think nor to speak prematurely but i dare say your father would drive us over if we asked him and we could stay a night there as you say a chat with the colonel always does him good End of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of Plain Living by Rolf Boulderwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Fifteen. So at Windigo and Wantabalry, the calm, uneventful bush life went on as usual. That life, so peaceful, so wholesome for the spirit, so chiefly free from the sharp cares and anxieties of city existence where the eye is refreshed daily with nature pictures at once grand and consoling the early morn so fair and fresh when the sun first glorifies the pale mists of dawn changing all the orient with magic suddenness to opaline hues and golden flame the green gloom the august solitude of the boundless forest the glowing sunshine which pierces even its inmost recesses at midday the wavering shadows born of the inconstant breeze the tender eve when a solemn hush falls alike on stream and valley on mountainside or wildwood glade and all the ancient majesty of night awes the senses for the windigill family the placid days came and went lightened as of old by the regularity of customary home duties by books and music by walks along the rippling river by rides and drives through the winding forest paths occasional expeditions to wantabalry made salutary change for all as the summer months wore on as the days lengthened and the midday heat became intense as the fiercer sun rays commenced to wither the bush herbage of the river meadows the many-hued wild flowers of heath and hill as the watercourses fed by spring showers commenced to trickle faintly there was a tendency to complain of the tyrant summer and yet to long for the christmas tide as a period of mirth and enjoyment this year invested with a special charm for had not a telegram from some unknown unknowable place and costing quite a small fortune arrived which stated that hubert the bien ami would return at christmas actually return like the prodigal as linda said only that it was the reverse in everything except the coincidence of its being from a far country the coincidence being so very slight linda said her mother perhaps it would have been as well to refrain from scriptural parallel altogether don't you think so miss dacre i had given up expecting him after his last letter in which he said there were insuperable difficulties in the way he has managed to surmount the insuperable apparently said linda hubert always was a wonderful boy for accomplishing things just at the last moment i don't think i ever knew him beaten by anything he made up his mind to do 
though he used to leave things rather too long that is one of hubert's worst points or rather most pronounced weaknesses said laura he won't be wise in time except on what he thinks are occasions of importance it seems a defect with people of energy and resource for instance i can't imagine hubert saying he will cross a river or accomplish a journey and failing to carry out his purpose whatever happened he is one of those people who seem made for difficulties but difficulties which come upon the unprepared are apt to be disastrous said miss dacre for my part i am strongly in favour of taking every imaginable precaution before the time of need the principle is good but it doesn't apply to hubert said linda still unconvinced difficulties and impossibilities only stimulate his resources which are innumerable when another man would lie down and die he would be quite in his element ordering inventing combining and finally pulling through triumphantly it must be interesting to watch such a tour de force said miss thacker but i prefer the generalship which surveys the field and places the battle in advance hit or miss conquerors find their moscow some day hubert has made a glorious campaign this time said laura what a day of days it will be when he shows his brown face at muramar again doesn't it seem an age since he went away rosalind i am sure papa and willoughby will be very glad to see him again said she i know they wish to have his advice about the sheep and the season they are getting quite anxious no the engine did not break down the steamer with the chinese name from the far north the lai wang fu did not founder or take fire the floods did not sweep away the railway bridges there was not even an earthquake all these phenomena and abnormal occurrences were in linda's opinion almost certain to happen because hubert was coming home to spend christmas with the family and envious fate would be certain to interfere everything had gone so prosperously hitherto that destiny must be propitiated by sacrifice mr barrington hope was coming up also as he had looked forward to a holiday of course he would be disappointed and so on wonderful to relate a few days before christmas again the family trap was in requisition driven by one of the boys the door of the first-class carriage opened and a bronzed indian officer-looking man stepped out the boys at first did not know him but when a tall broad-shouldered gentleman who followed him proposed to send a porter for their luggage the younger boy shouted out why it's hubert hubert what a lark we didn't know him why you have changed you're ever so much thinner and your eyes are larger and your face browner what have you done to yourself we've come for you and mr hope is this him yes this is he master morris your grammar appears to have stood still though you have grown such a big fellow see about the luggage and have it put in the buggy it will hold it all unless it has got smaller well how are mother and father and laura and linda and water king and everybody why didn't they come well they thought they'd be hugging you before all the people and they'd better wait and do it at home so they sent me and Val with the buggy you'd better drive that is my intention morris i prefer to drive though i know you can handle the reins but tell me about windigo what is the grass like had much rain only enough for sprinkling the garden these three months i heard old jerry the shepherd tell paddy nolan that he thought it was going to set in dry the west wind was always blowing we've lots of feet yet old jerry is a good judge of the weather at Moorama. he's been watching it these fifty years and how are they at wantabalry very poor i must starve him what said hubert and then laughing at the boy's strictly pastoral ideas he said you mean the sheep in the paddocks i suppose yes of course they're getting as bare as your hand what they'll do with all those sheep in another month or two nobody knows half of em will die before winter 
"You seem to take a practical view of things, Maurice," said Mr. Hope. "Are matters as bad as all that?" "Well, I'm about a good deal, and I can't help seeing. It's a pity, though, they're so nice, all of them." Hubert at home again, after all the doubts, fears, delays. Maurice had not exaggerated the amount of hugging, as he disrespectfully expressed it, which the returning hero had to undergo, and which would probably have created a stoppage on Muramont platform. Mr. Hope stood by with a tolerant air, and even made some light remark to Miss Dacre as to their being left out of the extremely warm greetings which prevailed. A very short time, however, was suffered to elapse before all due apologies were made to their guests, and the cordiality of Laura's manner, perhaps, caused Barrington Hope to overlook any overweening measure of love bestowed upon the long-absent brother. How her eyes sparkled! How her cheek glowed! How she seemed to devour the young fellow with her eyes, he said to himself. And he argued favorably, knowing something of womankind, of the probable devotion to her husband, should she ever condescend to endow mortal man with that supreme and sacred title. It was in vain to expect much general conversation that day. If the visitors had been less sympathetic persons, they might easily have been agreed at the predominance of Hubert's personal adventures, opinions, and experiences in all subsequent intercourse. For the moment, everybody thought him much altered and changed, wasted even in frame, sunburned, blackened by exposure, but on the whole improved. There was a determination in his expression which had not so habitually marked his features before, a look as of a man who has confronted the grim hazards of the waste, who has dared the odds which in the desert land of the savage are arrayed against him, dared them only to conquer. It was the face of the conscript after the campaign and the battlefield, if there was less than the old measure of schoolboy gaiety and frolicsome spirits, there was an added infusion of the dignity of the man. Then his adventures, he must relate some of them. Even Miss Dacre joined in this request. Like the knife grinder, story he had none to tell, but could not escape owning to having been laid up in a bark hut with fever and ague that had pulled him down so nearly drowned in crossing a flooded river had a brush with the blacks who rose up from the tall grass all round him horse speared under him and so on all this though hubert made light of it with characteristic modesty seemed to his hearers of the nature of thrilling and exciting romance hubert must feel like a troubadour of the middle ages said linda reciting before the lady of the castle and her maidens it must have been an awful temptation to improvise situations, and I dare say they did. Fancy if we had no books, and were dependent entirely upon wandering minstrels. It mightn't be altogether such a bad thing, Miss Linda, said Barrington Hope. A handsome young troubadour would be more entertaining than a dry book, or even an indifferent novel. It wouldn't be such a bad trade for the unemployed, said Laura, but I suspect neither their manners nor their education would be found suitable. Some of the swagmen in Queensland would fill the requirements so far, said Hubert. I have seen more than one honourable on the tramp, only it would not do to trust them too near the sideboard. What a pathetic picture, said Miss Dagger. Fancy the son of a peer trudging along the road, with his knapsack on his back, actually begging from door to door. It is not regarded as begging in outside country, said Hubert. It is the recognized mode of locomotion for laborers and artisans. And can they not procure steady employment? said Miss Dacker, in a tone of deep anxiety. Surely it only needs someone to take an interest in them, and give them good advice. Now, don't smile in that provoking way, Mr. Stamford, or I shall think you have brought back unimpaired one of your least amiable tricks. Forgive me, Miss Dacre, for presuming on my part to hint that you do not appear to be cured of what I supposed you would have learned by this time to distrust, an unlimited trust in your less favoured fellow creatures. The men of whom I speak live at free quarters when they travel 
are occasionally received on equal terms and are paid when they condescend to do work at the ordinary high rate of wages these from thirty shillings to two pounds per week with board and lodging and are they not encouraged to save this they could soon put by quite a small fortune their misfortune is that they never do save they invariably gamble or drink generally the latter till all is gone once lapsed they follow the habits of the uneducated working man with curious fidelity what a terrible condition what a terrible country where such things can take place on the contrary it is the best land attainable by the confirmed prodigal in england i take it the dissipated improvident men of their order go rapidly and thoroughly to the bad passing swiftly out of knowledge here they have intervals of wholesome labour and compulsory sobriety which recruit the constitution and give them opportunity for repentance if they ever do repent while this conversation was proceeding mr stamford and barrington hope had been having a quiet semi-business talk and this being concluded miss dacre was persuaded to open the piano after which mr hope gave them some of the latest corsicle morceau fresh from beirut where he had a musical correspondent having spent there some of the days of his youth music now absorbed all attention for the rest of the evening everybody being more or less of an amateur and even hubert showing that he had not been wholly without the region of sweet sounds by bringing back and displaying two new songs who played the accompaniments for you hubert said linda somebody did or you couldn't have loved them so well do you suppose there are no ladies in the never never country said he quite a mistake people of culture abound the next day was judged by common consent to be spent at wantabalry miss dacre was anxious to get home and would by no means consent to stay another day at windigo mr hope thought he would like to see wantabalry of which celebrated station he had heard so much and to pay his respects to the colonel so it was arranged that hubert should drive miss dacre and linda while laura went under mr hope's guidance in the windigill trap mr and mrs stamford elected to stay at home to take care of the house and talk quietly over hubert's return personal appearance prospects and generally interesting belongings arrived at wantabalry the colonel met them with his usual courteous and hospitable manner he congratulated hubert on his safe return from queensland and hoped he had not taken up all the good country as it seemed to him that other people would have to migrate if the season did not improve not for another year or two colonel at any rate said hubert cheerily you've plenty of water here and willoughby must do a little travelling anything's better than throwing up the sponge i see little else for it said the colonel who had come to wear an anxious expression miss dacre grew grave as she marked her father's face but she controlled herself with an effort as it seemed to hubert and telling linda to go into the drawing-room and admire her flowers followed her guests the men remained outside and lounged into the stable-yard where the horses and traps were being arranged looking about them and chatting on indifferent subjects before going to the house what a pretty situation you have here said hope the accomplished mr dealerson of whom i have heard so much must have been a man of taste how picturesquely the creek winds round the point near that splendid willow the elevation is just sufficient and the flat seems made on purpose for a few fields and the fruit garden the view of the distant mountain range completes the landscape capital stabling too oh confound him growled willoughby he was sharp enough to see that a smart homestead like this was just the thing to catch new chum buyers it's not bad in its way but i hate the whole thing so when i think of the price we shall have to pay for it that i could burn the house down with pleasure i don't know so much about that said hope it doesn't do to be hasty in realizing in stock matters any more than in purchasing you and hubert had better have a good talk over accounts before i leave and if you can suggest anything 
perhaps we may manage to tide over for a while he's quite a rising man of business i assure you i wish to heaven the governor had remained in sydney with my sister and sent me out to queensland with him said the young man but it's too late to think of that now we must make the best of it but i won't stand grumbling here all day mr hope come in and we'll see if there's any lunch to be had sufficient for the day and so on hubert had found his way into the drawing-room before this colloquy had ended and was looking over a collection of venetian photographs which miss dacre had collected during their last visit to that city of the sea i wonder if i shall ever see the line of st mark again she said i feel as if we were in another planet it is difficult to say where we shall all be in a few years time said hubert i am not going to stay here all my life but you won't run away from australia just yet miss dacre i should think not she replied cheerfully matters don't look like it at present the doubt in my mind is whether we shall ever be able to leave it i don't say that i am dissatisfied but i should like to see the old world again before i die when willoughby has made his fortune or other things come to pass you will be able to go home and do all sorts of fascinating travel said hubert we must look forward i feel certain you are not laughing at me mr stamford she said fixing her eyes upon him with a wistful expression but if i did not know you so well i should suspect it nothing of course is farther from my thought said the young man meeting the gaze with equal directness but i really see no reason to doubt your seeing europe within the next five years so many changes take place in this australian world of ours hardly such a change as that she replied smiling apparently at the absurdity of the idea and now i think i hear the luncheon bell you must have thought i meant to starve you all that no intention of this kind had actuated the fair hostess was made apparent as they were ushered into the dining-room a large and handsome apartment wherein the furniture and appointments were in keeping with the general plan of the house everybody was in capital spirits youth and hope were in the ascendant in the majority of the party and as their conversation became general everybody seemed as joyous as if want to balry were the best paying and the most fortunate station in the district what a lovely place this is altogether said linton mr davison must have some good in him after all if father and hubert had not been so prejudiced against him he might have married and settled in the district i believe he's not so bad looking i should never have come to see you for one said hubert if you had been the lucky girl that carried off such a prize but i should like to have condemned him to work out this place with its present stock in a dry season that would have been a truly appropriate punishment for his iniquities the ancients used to think of fitting fellows in another world in their own line but the savers of shop willoughby did you get any snipe this spring made two or three capital bags but they went off as soon as the weather got dry hares are getting plentiful too and i was going to get up a couple of greyhounds but all that sort of things knocked on the head now oh nonsense you mustn't give up your shooting never allow your business to interfere with your pleasure we have little enough recreation in australia you should have seen the brown quail in the mitchell grass in our new country i used to put up bevies of them looking like partridges i must take some sweaters up next time isn't the heat very dreadful up there inquired miss dacre rather tropical said hubert but there is a freshness in the air that carries you through the mosquitoes and sand-flies are perhaps the worst evils but with a good pisé house which you could shut up and keep cool they might be greatly reduced then the blacks they seem nearly as bad as the north american indians not quite i suspect sitting below a red cloud would have given us a deal more trouble not but what we have to be careful 
The best way, I find, is to treat them with perfect justice, to keep your word with them for good or evil. They learn to respect you in the end. After a while, we shall have no trouble with them. During the afternoon, which was devoted to nothing in particular, a very agreeable arrangement, which leaves guests at liberty to amuse themselves as they feel inclined, Hubert found himself in Miss Dacre's company at the end of the lower walk of the orchard, which followed the winding bank of the creek. The bank was high at this particular spot, having been partially worn away by flood waters, leaving a wide, low shore at the opposite side. A deep pool had been formed, which now gleamed and sparkled in the lowered sun rays. A grand weeping willow, self-planted, perhaps, in the earliest days of the occupation of the station, shaded it with trailing green streamers. Wantabalry is certainly the show station of the district, said Hubert. You were fortunate in some respects in having so pleasant a home in which to make your first Australian experiences. I have been very happy here, said she, but that will make it all the more painful to leave, as I fear we shall be obliged to do at no distant period. I do not so much care for my own sake, but it will be discouraging to Willoughby, and my father is certain to feel the change more than any of us. Matters look bad, and we are going to have another dry season, I believe, replied Hubert. I don't like these westerly winds, and clouds coming up with no rain. Still, there is hope. But had we not a drought two years before, just before my father made this purchase? Quite true, but of late years, unfortunately, there has been no reason why another should not follow in quick succession. It is rather unfair of madre nature, but there is no help for it. And what shall you do at Windigo? For I suppose we shall all be in the same boat. I shall persuade my father to stop every sheep he has, with the exception of the best flock, for my new country. The Wantabalry sheep had better take the road, too. I must have a talk to Willoughby. Oh, I do so wish you would, Mr. Stamford. I am sure he and Papa are grown very troubled about our prospects. Willoughby and I can bear all that may come, but it will be a terrible blow to poor Papa. Miss Dacre, if you will permit me to confide in you, I have been concocting a little plot. If carried out, it may, I say only it may, perhaps serve to improve the aspect of things. If you thought the Colonel would like to consult with me and Willoughby about the coming difficulty, I should be very glad to make the attempt. Nothing would give my father more pleasure, and indeed tend to relieve his mind. I feel certain he has been anxious to consult you, Mr. Stamford, but hardly likes to begin the subject. We must have a council of war, then, which will include Mr. Barrington Hope. He is a tower of strength, as I know by experience, and it's a good piece of luck is being here now. We should be grateful to you all the days of our lives, you may be sure, whatever happens, for the interest you have always shown in our welfare. If your advice had been taken in the first instance, all would have been well. And here the young lady looked at Hubert with such an approving expression of countenance that he felt as if he could throw up the new country and devote himself to the Sisyphean task of getting Wantabalry out of debt, if only she would promise to repay him by an occasional smile such as this one, the memory of which he felt certain would haunt him for an indefinite period. I can't, of course, guarantee success, but I think I see my way towards lightening the ship and getting steerage way on her. This nautical simile had probably been derived from his late maritime experiences, and was, perhaps, not altogether appropriate, but Miss Dacre was evidently not by any means in a critical frame of mind, for she again looked approvingly at him, and then led the way to the veranda, where Laura and Willoughby, Mr. Hope and Linda, were apparently having such an animated conversation that they seemed to be trying who could make the most noise. The principal contention was whether a town or country life was the more wholesome and enjoyable. 
laura and willoughby were in favour of rural felicity while linda and mr hope brought all the arguments they could think of in favour of cities greater stimulation of intellect removal of prejudice leaning towards altruism in fact higher general development of the individual when miss dacre arrived she being appealed to in the capacity of referee unhesitatingly gave her decision in favour of a country life stating her argument so clearly that she completely turned the scale besides causing hubert the keenest enjoyment by as he supposed thus laying bare her own predilections after this contest of wits the colonel appeared on the scene having returned from his usual afternoon's ride and hubert with some address managed to interest him in a discussion on station management and the probable profits of agriculture listening with deference to his senior's ideas and suggestions End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of plain living by rolf boulderwood this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter sixteen before the windigo party returned on the following day a council of war was held at the conclusion of which the colonel's face assumed a very different expression from that which it habitually wore the four men met in his study where the accounts assets and liabilities were laid before the financial authority who scanned them with keen and practised eye after what appeared to the others and especially to willoughby and his father an astonishingly short examination he raised his head and asked these pertinent questions i see your next bill twelve thousand four hundred and thirty seven pounds fourteen shillings ten d falls due in march he said after that there is nothing more to be met but station expenses for another year against which there will of course be the wool clip you have fifty four thousand seven hundred and eighty six sheep more or less on the run is that so half of which ought to die this winter hubert says oh yes they're all in the paddocks replied the younger Dacre, in a tone of reckless despair, while the colonel's face set with steadfast resolve, yet showed by the twitching of his lips how severe was the repression of feeling, how tense the strain of anxiety. "'Never mind about that just yet,' said Barrington Hope. "'We'll see into the available assets first. About this next bill, colonel, how do you propose to meet it?' "'By the sale of sheep, I suppose. There is no other way.' and if this drought comes to pass i am informed they will be next to valueless how is the next one of equal amount and another still to be paid in such a case i see nothing but ruin staring me in the face good god that i should have brought my poor children to such a pass here the brave soldier who had fought with cheerful courage on more than one battlefield when comrades lay dead and dying around him who had been the first man across the breach when the rebel artillery were mowing down his regiment like swaths of meadow grass at delhi appeared quite unmanned it will never do to give up the fight before the end of the day colonel said mr hope gently as a military man you must know that reserves may come up at any moment i will promise to give you a decided answer at the end of our colloquy but we must move according to the rules of war you must pardon me my dear sir said the colonel with a faint smile i trust not to embarrass the court again but the fact is i am a child in commercial affairs and the probable loss of my children's whole fortune touches me too acutely have you any advice to offer hubert queried hope i understand we are all here on terms of friendly equality yes i have said the young man with an air of decision you can judge of its value all the windigo sheep with the exception of a couple of blocks of studs start for our queensland country in january the dry belt 
likely to be affected by the coming drought is a narrow one not more than two hundred miles wide and as the sheep are fairly strong now though they won't remain so they should cross that with trifling loss donald greenhall a first-class man has agreed to go in charge sheep are sheep over there now for stocking up new country and we can sell to advantage what we do not want for windigo downs the larger the number sent in one overland journey like this the smaller the expense of droving per head i propose that wantabalree should be cleared in the same way willoughby can go in charge of his own sheep and we can share the expense i see nothing to prevent your idea from being carried out said mr hope i am aware that sheep of good quality as the wantabalree sheep proverbially are are scarce and saleable at higher rates in the new country the main thing will be to have a first-class road overseer greenhow has been out with an exploring party over all that country said hubert and as a head drover is worth his weight in gold a sober steady fellow too and a good hand with men no better bushman anywhere i am ready to start next week said willoughby with the fire of ardent youth in his kindling eye i never expected to have such a chance but and here his face became grave and thoughtful what do you say father will you and rosalind be able to get on without me we must try my boy the time will pass heavily i doubt not but and here he walked over to hubert and put his hand on his firm shoulder your father did not grudge you in the path of honourable ambition nor can i be more selfish god bless you both my boys and bring you safe back once more to gladden our hearts it seems to me as if providence had decided this issue and that i have little hand in it i wish now to understand colonel dacre said hope if upon their arrival in queensland you will place twenty thousand sheep in our hands for sale at such prices as may be then ruling and whether by the terms of your mortgage to mr dealerson who has of course taken care to tie you up as tightly as he could you have the power of disposing of so many it so happens that i have permission to reduce the stock i believe that's the expression by just such a number said the colonel more cheerfully and i most willingly invest you with the power of disposing of them then i will take upon myself to state that the austral agency company will guarantee to take up your bill next coming due and to provide you with funds to carry you over the next shearing when we may perhaps make a more complete and satisfactory arrangement the colonel gazed at mr hope with an expression as of one not fully realizing the effect of the words he heard with his outward ears then suddenly stepping forward he stretched out his hand and taking that of the younger man wrung it silently he retreated to his chair where he sat down with an expression of relief too deep for words he then left apparently all further transactions of the interview in the hands of the coming race they began to go into detail a little as if about un fait accompli hubert more particularly talking rapidly in order to cover any appearance of awkwardness on the part of his hosts you know he said that by doing this travelling business we hedge so to speak instead of standing to lose on the double event of a dry season and a panic in the money market more than any of us can afford if the weather breaks in february of course we needn't have started but we can't lose anything as our sheep will be regularly run after when we get them over and at high prices too they talk of maiden ewes being worth a pound from the shares and anything else fifteen shillings while if it holds dry for three or four months here sheep will have to be given away or next thing to it i suppose i shall have to hire a lot of shepherds said willoughby that would be a nuisance won't it if i were you i'd leave 
all that to Greenhaugh. He's accustomed to these fellows, and knows how to talk to them on the road, which you don't. You'd better ostensibly be second in command of the expedition. You won't have much responsibility, and we'll be able to pick up heaps of experience. All you will have to find will be your own horses. He'll arrange everything else, and keep the accounts of rations and wages, which you and I can settle when you get there. I suppose there's a strong probability of a drought setting in, said Mr. Hope. If not, you will be rather premature. The more I see of the weather signs, the more certain I am that we are on the edge of another drought, perhaps worse than the last, said Hubert. You'll see that a great many people will hang on, expecting it to break up, then making sure of getting tail end of the tropical rains, and generally trusting to the doctrine of chances until their sheep get too weak to travel, and then... And what then? asked Willoughby. I haven't had the pleasure of witnessing a dry season as yet. Hubert smiled grimly. You will thank your stars the Waterbury sheep cleared out in time. You would never have forgotten it as long as you lived. Some squatters will lose half their stock, some two-thirds, some even more. A man told me he lost a hundred thousand sheep in the last drought, but he could afford it. If it's going to be so bad, what will your governor and mine do with the sheep we leave behind? For we must leave some. They will have all the grass and water to themselves, which will give them a chance, and then, if it gets very cruel, they must cut scrub and oak for them. Cut the trees down, said Willoughby, with astonishment. I never heard of such a thing. You'll find out everything in time, said Hubert. The brave old oak has an antipodean signification here. I don't know what we should do without him in a dry time. I've known sheep kept in good condition that hadn't seen grass for eighteen months. Before the drive back, which took place after lunch, in the midst of pathetic leave-takings between the Wendigo girls and Miss Dacre, the latter young lady took an opportunity of expressing to Hubert her sincere gratitude for his organization of the opportune alliance, which was, so to speak, to raise the siege of Wantabalre. It has made dearest Papa quite young again, she said. For weeks he has not been able to sleep at night, but used to get up and go wandering up and down the garden. I really began to fear for his reason, and now he seems quite a different man. I am so happy myself at the change for the better, that I cannot feel properly sorry that dear Willoughby is going away from us. He is going among friends, at any rate, Miss Dacre, said Hubert pressing the young lady's hand warmly in the agitation of the moment. He will be well looked after, rely upon it. I feel certain it will be for everybody's benefit in the long run. I shall always think that you and that good genius, Mr. Hope, have stood between us and ruin, said she, and here her bright, steadfast eyes were somewhat dimmed. If Papa does not say all that is in his heart, believe me, that we are not ungrateful nothing could ever lead me to think that said hubert meeting her eyes with a glance which expressed more than that simple sentence if freely translated whatever happens i am more than repaid by your approval by this time whalebone and whipcord harnessed up and having their heads turned homeward began to exhibit signs of impatience which caused Linda to call out to Hubert that she was sure Whipcord would throw himself down and break the pole if they didn't start at once, which appalling contingency cut short the interview to Hubert's secret indignation. This expressed itself in letting them out with a will and quitting Wantabalry at the rate of fourteen miles an hour. Some people would have felt nervous at proceeding along a winding, narrow bush road, well furnished with stumps at such an express train rate but the sure hand and steady eye of hubert stamford in combination with the light mouths and regular if speedy movement 
of the well-matched horses engendered the most absolute confidence in his driving what do you think of bush life generally mr hope said laura after the first rush of the excitable goers had steadied into a twelve mile an hour trot and how do you like wantabalree i think the wantabalree people perfect in their own way worthy to be neighbours of windahill he added with a slight inclination of his head a man could live there very happily with one fair spirit to be his minister if miss dacre would condescend to the office it's a lovely veranda to read in it would be like the days of thalaba while it lasted and why should it not last demanded laura the bush appears to me the place of all others where the feelings and emotions are the most permanent and deep-seated barrington hope fixed his eyes upon her as she spoke with a gaze wistful and almost melancholy in its earnestness can anything endure that is fair joyous dreamlike in this uncertain life of ours he said is the ideal existence realized for most of us or if so does it continue you are more fortunate than i in your experiences if such is your belief surely you have no reason to talk of despondency said she turning towards him her bright face in which the summer time seemed idealized you who have made a success in your profession and whom everybody talks of with i won't say admiration it might make you conceited but high approval i have done fairly well i suppose he said i may take it as the natural consequence of twenty years hard unrelieved work i have coined my brain my very heart's blood for it i will not say but that i have had my reward in approved success and high consideration but at times a feeling comes over me of unrest and of doubt well-nigh despair as to the reality of human happiness the value of success against which i can scarcely defend myself you have been working too hard lately reaction has set in in old days hubert used to suffer so occasionally doubting whether life was worth living etc but with men it is generally a temporary ailment you must take life easily for the next few weeks and like the old farm labourer in the village church think about nothing linda and i must cultivate part singing and improve our acquaintance with wagner now that we have the benefit of your criticism it is a passing weakness i suppose he said still you would wonder at its intensity but i didn't come here to bore you with my whims and fancies one thing i shall carry away as a pleasant souvenir that hubert and i have been able to lighten the load on poor old colonel dacre's heart i am charmed beyond measure said laura hubert told me something though he is such a close creature when he is speaking about himself that i could get next to nothing out of him willoughby will be able to get the sheep away to queensland i suppose with ours and they may not be ruined after all they will have a struggle but i really believe the station will pull through with hubert's assistance and advice if anything serious does happen at wantabalree it will not be for want of all the aid that an energetic young friend can furnish i can see as much as that and so can i said laura he could find no better or sweeter reason if he looked for a century linda and hubert according to their wont and usage were embarked in such an animated argument that it is probable they did not hear this last confidential reference more especially as perhaps for the greater convenience of separate converse the speaker's voices had become somewhat lowered and hubert's attention was partly taken up with his horses the twenty miles were accomplished in less than two hours the horses in as hard condition upon the now partially dried summer grasses as if they had been stabled apparently treated the drive as the merest trifle trotting off down the paddock when released from harness apparently as free from fatigue as if they had not gone a mile i must say your bush horses surprise me said mr hope they are like arabs of the desert for speed and hardihood these two are little out of the common 
said Hubert, not plentiful here or anywhere else. The Merry Christmas tide was nearly spent, a season fully enjoyed in those newer Englands, which are growing fast and blooming fair beneath the Southern Cross, in despite of the red summer sun and brown crisp pastures, a blessed time of rest from toil, surcease of sorrow, gathering of friends and kinsfolk. Barrington Hope had thoroughly enjoyed his holiday, more he averred than on any previous vacation of his life. There had been walks, drives, and rides, picnics to the limestone caves in the vicinity where vast halls were explored by the light of torches, stalactites brought home in triumph, and wondrous depths of gloom and primeval chaos penetrated fishing parties on the river where although the water trickled faintly over the gravelly shallows the wide reaches were deep and sport permitting occasional visits to moramont township their communication with the outer world helped to fill up the term and drive away the dreadful thought uppermost in the hearts of the wendigo family that hubert was soon to leave them for the far north land as soon as christmas was well over the serious work of the year only interrupted by this truce of god began again with even greater energy the industrial battle never long pretermitted in australia raged furiously so there was great mustering on wendigil and wantabalry counting of sheep and, and tar branding of the same with the travelling tea hiring of shepherds and knockabout men purchase of rations tools horses drays harness hobbles bales 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 as linda quoted in short the thousand and one road requisites for a long overland journey towards the end of january mr donald greenhaw arrived riding one serviceable horse and leading another whereon disposed over a pack saddle was all his worldly wealth deposited a keen-eyed mild-voiced scottish australian sun bronzed and lean as an arab who looked as if the desert sun had dried all superfluous moisture out of his wiry frame he superintended the preparations at windigil in a quiet superior sort of way occasionally offering suggestions but chiefly leaving hubert to manage matters as he thought fit he also found time to go over to wantabalry where he remained a week meeting with apparently greater exercise for his generalship at length the great day of departure arrived the first flock of two thousand took the road through the north windigale gate followed by a second at a decent interval until the whole thirty thousand sheep passed out next day the advanced guard of the wantabalry contingent showed themselves greenhow having decided to keep a day's march between them forty thousand of these came by the fat and saleable sheep of both stations had been retained after these had been sold in the autumnal markets there would be but a small and manageable balance on either station the colonel came as far as windigale and even a stage further with his daughter to see his boy off they were dreadfully downhearted and saddened in appearance as they called at windigale on their homeward route but cheered up a little under the attentions of sympathizing friends hubert had remained behind not choosing to follow for another week he was already beginning to assume the air of a large operator and successful explorer Greenhaw can do all that business as well or better than i can he said it's no use paying a man and doing the work yourself i can catch them up easily before they get to banda then we might have had willoughby for another week said miss dacre with a slightly reproachful air i don't suppose it would have made much difference admitted hubert but it is perhaps as well that he made the start with the sheep he has a larger lot to look after i don't know but that it's as well to have the wrench at once and get it over like a double tooth you know it's the most philosophical way to look at it said the girl smiling through her tears and no tongue can tell the comfort 
it has been to us to know that matters are in a comparatively favourable train i must not weary you with protestations but papa and i can never adequately express our gratitude that could be done easily enough thought the young man but he said at present it's only a case of good intentions we must wait to see how they turn out how will you and the colonel get on by yourselves better than i at first thought will it be left as our working overseer who will do excellently to look after a smaller number of sheep it will just give papa exercise and occupation to help him to manage them he says laura and linda must be good neighbours and perhaps mr stamford would come over now and then and indulge papa with a game of whist i will undertake everything said hubert for our people but you and the colonel must reciprocate if both families make common cause till johnny comes marching home i mean willoughby you will find the time pass more quickly than you anticipate those last days of a pleasant holiday time what an element of sadness pervades them how swiftly they fly ah me the flowers fade the sky clouds over as if at the touch of an untoward magician the land of fairy recedes the region of plain prose of arduous effort and heroic but dreary self-abnegation looms painfully near much however of this sombre aspect of the inevitable is relieved in early youth by the kindly glamour of high hope and the ardent imagination of the as yet successful aspirant for him the forest gloom is but the high road to the castle of the enchanted princess the sternest tourney is more than recompensed by the smiles of his queen of beauty the burning summer day the drear winter night but aids to fortune and accessories to boundless wealth so for barrington hope and hubert stamford the tranquil days came and went scarce tinged with melancholy till the fateful morn of departure arrived before noon windigill was left desolate and forsaken of its heroes hubert fared forth along the northwest trail bound for the sea-like plains of the lower laurel where the wild orange flowers bloom on their lonely sand islands bright with glossy-leaved shrubs where the emu rears her brood undisturbed under the sad-hued myall that waves her slender streamers and whispers ghost-like at midnight to the pitiless desert moon mr barrington hope on the other hand betook himself by rail to the metropolis to plunge once more with the eagerness of a strong swimmer into the great ocean of speculative finance which there heaves and seethes away but before he departed he had transacted a rather important interview in which laura stamford was the person chiefly interested had indeed promised to re revisit windigill before the winter ended End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of plain living by rolf boulderwood this librivox recording is in the public domain read it by matt Perard. chapter seventeen local critics were not lacking around mooramah as in other places they failed not to make unfavorable comments upon hubert's decided course of action they were pleased to say that young man was going too fast was leading his father into hazardous speculations all this new country that such a fuss was made about was too far off to pay interest upon the capital for years and years to come the austral agency company had better mind what they were about or they would drop something serious if they went on backing every boy that wanted to take up outside country instead of making the most of what his family had and helping his parents at home as for young dacre he would most likely get his sheep eaten by the blacks and himself speared as he knew nothing about the bush and hardly could tell the difference between a broken-mouthed ewe and a weaner besides the season might turn around after all there was plenty of time for rain yet 
most likely it would come in february as it had often done before travelling cheap was a most expensive game and you were never done putting your hand in your pocket thus argued the unambitious stay-at-home easy-going section of society which obtains in rural australia in almost the same proportion and degree that it does in english counties in the older settled portions of the land one may discern the same tendency to overcrowding the given area with unnecessary adults procuring but a bare subsistence narrowing with each generation as in britain where sons of proprietors are too often contented to sink somewhat in the social scale rather than forego the so-called comforts of civilized life the poorly paid curate the irish squireen jock the laird's brother and the french hobereau so cordially hated by the peasantry before the revolution are examples of this class and in the older settled portions of australia are to be found far too many men of birth and breeding who are contented to abide in the enjoyment of the small amenities of country town life to sink down to the positions of yeomen farmers and tenants rather than turn their faces to the broad desert as their fathers did before them and carve out for themselves even at the cost of peril and privation a heritage worthy of a race of sea kings and conquerors hubert stamford did not belong by any means to the contended mediocrities willoughby dacre was a kindred spirit so the two young men fared cheerfully forth across the dusty thirsty zone beyond which lay the promised land hard work and wearisome it was in a sense but held nothing to daunt strong men in the full vigour of early manhood the days were hot and willoughby's english skin peeled off in patches for the first week or two from the exposed portions of his person but cooler airs came before midnight and the appetites of both after long days in the saddle were surprising the sheep being in good condition at starting bore the forced marches which were necessary fairly well donald greenhall seemed to know every creek watercourse and spring in the whole country and on one fine day willoughby pulled up his horse and in a tone of extreme surprise exclaimed why there's grass pointing to a fine green tuft of the succulent bromus mitchelli it was even so they had struck the rain line marked as with a measuring tape henceforth all was peace and plenty with the rejoicing flocks which grew strong and even fat as they fed onward through a land of succulent herbage and full-fed streams well willoughby old man what do you think of this asked hubert one evening as they sat on a log before their tent and watched the converging flocks feeding into camp marked also the fantastic summits of isolated volcanic peaks which stood like watch-towers amid a grass ocean waving billowy in the breeze do you think we did well to cut the painter how do you suppose all these sheep would have looked at windigill and walter Balry? they've had no rain yet said willoughby in that letter i got at the last township we passed the governor said there hadn't been a shower since i left it's nearly three months now and we should hardly have had a sheep to our name by this time there'll be some awful losses in the district said hubert men will put off clearing out too till too late my own idea is that this will be a worse drought all down the wauru than the last one our people will make shift to feed the few sheep we have left thank goodness and we have enough here to stop more than one run or two either when they kill downs will carry a hundred thousand sheep if it will ten all we have to do now is to breed up that's plain sailing i wish we had some wantabalry downs ready to take you up said willoughby regretfully if we hadn't those beastly bills yet to pay we might have done something in that way too wait till we've settled a bit and have landed the sheep all safe said hubert that will be stage the first after we see that we must go on better barrington hope is a good backer and outside country is to be had cheap just now events 
in that sort of contrary way which occasionally obtains in this world went far to justify the bold policy of this competent young man who quietly ignored his elders and to confound the wise represented by the cautious crookers who stayed at home and disparaged him there had occurred a drought of crushing severity but three years since and only one good that is rainy season had intervened so rendering it unlikely and in a sense unreasonable and outrageous as one exasperated impeacher of providence averred that another year of famine should so soon succeed nevertheless the rain came not the long hot summer waned autumn lingered with sunny days and cold nights winter too with hard frosts with black wailing winds that seemed to mourn over the dead earth and its dumbly dying tribes but no rain no rain the havoc which then devastated all the great district watered by the waru and its tributaries was piteous and terrible to behold rich and poor small and great owners of stock fared alike a herd of five thousand head of cattle died on muragomarang to the last beast eight thousand at wando john stokes angus campbell patrick murphy struggling farmers lost every milch cow every sheep every horse they were too short of cash to travel their small pastures of a few hundred acres were as dust and ashes too careless to provide a stock of hay and straw settling all when prices were good and chancing it they lost hoof and horn mammoth squatters were short fifty thousand sheep seventy thousand a hundred thousand smaller graziers with fifteen or twenty thousand lost two-thirds three-fourths four-fifths as the case may be ruin and desolation overspread the land wagon-loads of bales stripped from the skins of starved sheep dead wool as it was familiarly called were seen unseasonably moving along the roads in all directions from all this death and destruction hubert's family and the wantabalry people had been preserved as they now gratefully remembered by his prompt yet well-considered action harold stamford as he watched his stud flocks fairly nourished and thriving from constant change of pasture which the empty paddocks permitted thanked god in his heart for the son who had always been the mainstay of his father's house while the colonel was never weary of invoking blessings on hubert's head and wishing that it had been his lot to have been presented with a commission in the imperial army in which so bold and cool a subaltern would have been certain to have distinguished himself better as it is father said miss dacre he might have sold out and lost his money in a bad station except for the honour and glory i think squatting is the better profession after all if willoughby only turns out successful i shall think australia the finest country in the world we shall have to live in it my darling for a long time as far as i see so we may as well think so said the colonel suppose we drive over to windigill and have another rubber of whist stamford plays a sound game though he's too slow with his trumps and laura has quite a talent for it such a memory too many games of whist were played much quiet interchange of hopes and fears discussions of small events and occurrences such as make up the sum of rural daily life had taken place between the two families ere the famine year ended it left a trail of ruin not wholly financial old properties had been sold high hopes laid low never to arise strong hearts broken mourning and lamentation and woe had followed each month and still nature showed no sign of relenting pity through all this devastation the life of the dwellers at windigill had been comparatively tranquil if not demonstratively joyous yet free from serious mishap or anxiety the tidings from the far country were eminently satisfactory and as regular as circumstances would permit windigill downs was quoted as one of the crack stations of north queensland and in order to devote his whole attention to that principality in embryo 
hubert had sold his share in the first station purchased to willoughby on long credit all the wantabalry sheep were there and doing splendidly mr delamere and willoughby were sworn friends and whenever hubert could get a chance to come in delamere would take his place at windigill downs and leave willoughby in charge at the home station added to this mr hope had taken over the wantabalry account and saw no difficulty in providing for future payment and working expenses this was good news in every sense of the word the colonel became so exceedingly cheerful and sanguine that his daughter again asserted that he must be thinking of a stepmother for her in which behalf she implored laura and linda to continue their complaisance towards him lest he should in despair go farther afield and so be appropriated by some enterprising daughter of hat that is all very well said linda i suppose it's a quiet way of warning us off but here we are living in a kind of pastoral nunnery with no society to speak of and nothing to do the atmosphere is pervaded with bouquet to merino for though ours are all right i feel certain i can catch the perfume of mr dardell's dead sheep across the river now why shouldn't i take compassion on the colonel i like mature men and can't bear boys i should rather enjoy ordering a superior girl like you about wouldn't it be grand laura i have no doubt rosalind will grant you her full permission said laura if you think such a little chit as you is likely to attract a man like colonel dacre little chit indeed said linda indignantly that's the very reason it would be my youth and freshness and general stupidity in the ways of the world that would attract him oh dear i think of the white satin too i should look so lovely in white satin with a haunted in lace veil and a train then linda began to walk up and down the room in a stately manner which created a burst of laughter and general hilarity now that fortune had taken it into her head to be kind she like other personages of her sex became almost demonstrative in her attentions every letter from queensland contained news of a gratifying and exhilarating nature hubert had heard of some forfeited country of which he had informed willoughby who having gone out with the requisite number of sheep blackfellows and shepherds had taken it up he expected in a year or so to sell a portion of it there being about a thousand square miles altogether and thus helped to clear off the Watabalry account. As soon as they got it into working order, they would sell Delamere and Dacre's home station with twenty thousand sheep, and put all their capital into Glastonbury, as Mr. Delamere had chosen to name the new property. Hubert had several times been offered a high price for Windigill Downs, but he was not disposed to sell on any terms, being bent on stocking it up and improving it so as fully to develop its capacity some day when the projected railway from roma comes through we'll have a syndicate born to buy it hubert said in the meantime there's a few thousand acres of freehold to pick up round old windy hill all this was very well said the dwellers in the new homes but were the young men going to stay away for ever they might just as well be in england surely now that the season had changed and everything was going on so prosperously they could afford two or three months time to see their relatives this view of the case was pressed upon hubert's attention in several of laura's letters linda went so far as to threaten that she would in default of hubert's paying attention to her next letter invent an admirer of distinguished appearance for miss dacre which harrowing contingency might serve to bring back the wanderer but there be many important and indeed indispensable duties in the new country men are scarce responsibilities are heavy risks abound the captain and the first mate cannot leave the ship be the inducements ever so great until the anchor is down some day however the commander dons his shore-going togs frock coat tall hat gloves and all the rest of it and goes in for a little well-earned enjoyment so 
as again the summer days drew near word came that matters had so moulded themselves that hubert and willoughby were on the homeward track the home station of delamere and dacre had been sold to messrs jinks and newboy with thirty-three thousand sheep at a satisfactory price vide the aramac arrow as the energetic proprietors had concluded to concentrate their capital upon their magnificent newly taken up property of glastonbury mr delamere was to locate himself thereon in the absence of his partner while donald greenhaw would be left in charge of windigale downs now pretty well in working order hubert and willoughby would come down from rockhampton by steamer to sydney and might be expected to be home in a month or six weeks at farthest this promise they faithfully carried out and by a remarkable coincidence mr barrington hope arranged to have a short holiday and come up to windigale with them there is a little true happiness in the world however hard-hearted materialists and cynical poets affect to deny the fact there might have been an approximation in other young persons lives to the state of blissful content in which the two families were steeped to the lips on the arrival of the long-absent heroes but no conceivable satisfaction here below could have exceeded it the colonel kept walking round his son taking in every personal detail with unflagging interest for hours and hours as miss dacre averred she was positive he never took his eyes off him except when he retired to bed for a whole week afterwards laura and linda declared hubert had grown bigger taller handsomer older in short had in every way improved miss dacre when called upon to confirm the decision seemed to have a slight difficulty in putting her opinion into some suitable form but it was understood to be on the whole favourable at any rate the object of all this affectionate interest had reason so to believe mr barrington hope was surprised to find both home stations alive and kicking so to speak after the terrific ordeal which they had undergone but as he remarked understocking was a more scientific mode of management than most squatters would allow it was many a year since the paddocks on either station had looked so well as to the non-wool-bearing inhabitants he was lost in astonishment at their brilliant appearance after the deprivation of so many of the comforts of life we were sorely tempted to go away to sydney during the worst part of the drought said laura father gave us leave at the end of one terrible month when we had not tasted milk butter or any decent meat but as mr dacre and hubert were living on salt beef and pig's face mesembryanthemum when last heard from and risking their lives as well moreover as rosalind wouldn't hear of leaving the colonel we determined to bear our share of discomfort also i declare i drink quite nice and thin said linda who was sometimes uneasy about a possibly redundant figure mine was just what the old novelist used to call a slight but rounded form laura and poor rosalind fell off dreadfully though no vegetables either we were reduced to eating an onion one day with positive relish father said it was medicinally necessary good heavens if i had had the least idea that matters were so bad said mr hope glancing at laura with a look of the tenderest compassion i should have insisted upon everybody migrating to sydney and come up in person to take charge or done something desperate i should indeed that would have been a last resource said hubert laughing fancy the austral agency company with the manager ruralizing at such a time that would have caused a financial earthquake which would have been more serious than the absence of milk and butter and a short supply of vegetables never mind it was only a temporary inconvenience much to be lamented doubtless but everybody looks very nice notwithstanding i suppose we can put up with the old place for a few weeks longer interposed mr stamford after christmas as we've all been such good boys and girls i think we're due for another trip to sydney i want to see the pantomime for one miss dacre requires change of air 
i'm not sure that the climate of tasmania or melbourne wouldn't brace us all up after the rather well not particularly exciting life we've had for the last year oh you dear old father said linda you're a man of the most original ideas and splendid ingenuity you've divined our inmost thoughts intuitively with such a prospect before them the members of both families endured the unmistakably warm weather which generally precedes christmas with philosophical composure indeed so extremely contented were they with the existing state of affairs that linda vowed it was hardly worth while going away at all this unnaturally virtuous state of mind was however combated by the majority who possibly had reasons of their own for desiring to wander for a season far from their usual surroundings for early in the first week of the new year the Murama independent and waru isle and bunda Burhama advertiser contained this wildly interesting announcement marriages on the third january by the rev edward chauffant at st john's church Murama, hubert eldest son of harold stamford esq of windigill to rosalind only daughter of lieutenant colonel rupert dacre of wantabalry late of her majesty's eighty-third regiment at the same time and place barrington second son of commander collingwood hope royal navy to laura eldest daughter of harold stamford esq of windigill these momentous events were not wholly unexpected it may be imagined how the church at Morama was crowded on that day. It was not a particularly small one either, having been built mainly through the exertions of an energetic young clergyman who did not allow himself to be discouraged by the fact that a considerable debt thereon still remained unpaid. So there was not a seat, or half a seat, to be had inside, while a much larger congregation than usual stood around the porch and entrance doors school children strewed flowers on the pathway of the happy brides and none of the usual ceremonies were omitted as it had not rained for three months and apparently was not likely to do so for three more the old world proverb happy is the bride that the sun shines on received most literal fulfilment however the near prospect of ocean breeze and plashing wavelets sustained them amid the too ardent sun rays hubert as a local celebrity came in for a certain amount of guarded approval and in spite of the misgivings with which his napoleonic policy had been regarded it was concluded that he looked twice the man since his departure for foreign parts rosalind dacre quietly though becomingly dressed on that account was thought to have scarcely paid due and befitting regard to her serious and sacred duty as a bride but as to laura there was no thought of dispraise or any the faintest doubt universally admired and beloved the flower of a family not less popular than respected in the district each one in that crowded building seemed to take a personal pride in her day of maiden triumph barrington hope radiantly happy in enjoying the prestige of a distinguished stranger also received the highest compliments of the spectators by being declared to be worthy of the belle of Murama. the happy couples departed by train to melbourne en route for tasmania that favoured isle where the summer of britain is reproduced with the improved conditions of assured fine weather and a less inconvenient proximity to the pole there annually do the desert-worn pilgrims from the tropic north and central wastes of the australian continent resort for coolness greenery and agreeable society as to the garden of armida thus in those rare intervals when they were not engaged in gazing on the perfections of their brides were hubert stamford and barrington hope enabled to indulge in a little pioneer talk and to listen to far-off echoes from the wild scenes which the former had so lately quitted mr and mrs stamford with linda remained for a few days longer before they took wing for the metropolis leaving behind the colonel and willoughby who elected to remain at home in charge of both stations they arrived in sydney just in time to take leave of their friends the grandisons 
chatsworth had been let for a term of years and preparations were complete for their going to live upon one of the station properties the fact is my dear fellow said mr grandison that my wife and i have resolved to take these younger children up into the bush and live there quietly with them till their education is finished we must try if possible to bring them up in an atmosphere untainted by fashionable folly and excitement it has been the ruin at least i think so of the older ones now that josie has married what josie married exclaimed mr stamford i never heard of it you astonish me married indeed said mrs grandison who now joined them and a pretty match she has made of it not that there's anything against the young man he's two or three years younger than she is except that he's rather stupid and hasn't an idea of anything except billiards and betting that i can discover as he's only a clerk in an insurance office he has just enough to keep himself and not a penny for a wife unless what her parents give her the sort of young fellow i never shall be able to take the slightest interest in said mr grandison not bad-looking i suppose but quite incapable of raising himself a single step by his own exertions or aspiring to anything beyond a sufficiency of cigars and an afternoon lounge in george street of course you tried to prevent the marriage said mrs stamford but it's too late now to do anything but make the best of it for poor josie's sake mr grandison turned away his head as his wife said in a tone of deep feeling the silly girl went and was married before the registrar she knew we could not approve of it and took that means of being beforehand with us her father won't see her yet but of course she'll have an allowance and we must help them if he keeps steady but it nearly broke our hearts you may believe we see all these things too late said her husband with a sigh which he tried bravely to repress if we had brought our children up with other ideas or placed before them higher objects of ambition a different result might have been reached over and over again have i cursed the day when we left the bush for good for good indeed and came to live in this city of shams no worse than other places i believe but all this artificial town life while not too good for older people is ruin and destruction for young ones what a fortunate man you've been stamford though in our selfish grief i've forgotten to congratulate you it is the goodness of god he replied warmly grasping the hand which was silently held out to him my children have never given me a moment's anxiety we have been sheltered too from the temptations of the world and so far from the deceitfulness of riches i can never be sufficiently thankful that won't last long said mr grandison with an effort to be cheerful people tell me that windigo downs is going to be the finest cheap property west of the barcoo and hubert's reputation as a pioneer is in everybody's mouth now he managed to pull the colonel's investment out of the fire well paid for it too by all i hear give our love to laura she must live in sydney i suppose now she's married a business man a rising fellow barrington hope and one of the smartest operators we have high hope time's up we shall meet again some day i hope when i have a better story to tell you mrs stamford was sincerely grieved to hear of this latest misfortune of the grandison family she could hardly forgive josie for the insincerity and ingratitude with which she had acted however said the kindly matron in continuation perhaps it is not so bad as they are disposed to think they're dreadfully disappointed of course if the young man's character is good he may get on and of course mr grandison will help them by and by it will do josie good to have a house of her own to look after and to be obliged to save and contrive the girl's heart is not naturally bad i believe but she has been spoiled by overindulgence and extravagance ever since she was a baby a poor marriage may be the best thing that ever happened to her oh harold should we not be deeply grateful for the mercy of providence in so ordering our lives that until lately we have never had any money to spare and self-denial 
has been compulsory hm said mr stamford musingly no doubt too much money is one form of danger of moral death which the devil must regard with great great complacency few people take that view though i am very glad we have never been tried in that way said mrs stamford simply looking up into her husband's face i have pitied you darling when i have seen you tormented and anxious about money matters but we have always been very happy among ourselves even when things were at their worst there is no chance now i suppose of our affairs going wrong these queensland stations are quite safe quite safe my dearest wife answered harold stamford with a pang of remorse at his heart as he imprinted a kiss on the fond face which had never looked into his save with truth and love shining in her clear eyes safe as a bank or suppose we say as australian debentures i don't mind affirming that nothing humanely speaking could materially injure our investments now i am glad to hear that for the dear children's sake she answered if their future is secured that is everything before the close of the summer a naval squadron cruising in australian waters strange to say happened to need partial refitting in sydney harbour and entering that picturesque haven anchored as usual in farm cove in one of the delicious sea-girdled nooks of neutral bay it so chanced that mr stamford had rented a furnished villa for the season the ladies were wont to use the telescope in close inspection of any strange vessel that approached wonderful to relate it appeared that the frigate which on a previous occasion had been the ocean home of lieutenant fitzhurst was even now among the graceful warhawks which after battling with storm and tempest were so to speak furling their pinions under linda's excited gaze there may or may not be a new system of marine telegraphy but the fact comes within my experience that naval men have exceptionally prompt means of discovery upon arrival in port whether the ladies of their acquaintance are in town and if so where they abide it so chanced therefore that upon the following afternoon a gig left h m s vengeful and with eight able seamen pulled straight for the dirrambah jetty landing the lieutenant and a brother officer who making their call in due form betrayed great anxiety for the health of mr and mrs stamford and the young ladies during their long absence from sydney they were also politely astonished at the news of miss stamford's and hubert's marriages indeed the recital of the family news presumably as conveyed by linda to mr fitzers in full during an examination of the greenhouse lasted so long that mrs stamford looked several times from the window and the gallant tars in the boat referred to the protracted absence of their superior officers in unqualified saxon terms what more is left to tell it would appear that there might have been a previously implied if unspoken confession between the young people reference being permitted to stamford pair and satisfactory credentials forthcoming it was arranged that an engagement should be officially allowed hope being cautiously held out by that wary diplomatist that in the event of the coveted step being attained the full concession might be thought about which decision gave unqualified satisfaction linda being as she averred willing to wait for years indeed rather glad on the whole that separation and delay were necessary so that she might have time to think over and thoroughly enjoy her unparalleled happiness with the autumn came the returning travellers hubert declaring that he dared not stay away another week from the downs frightful consequences might happen mr hope and laura preparing to inhabit the comfortable abode which for a few years to come they had agreed would be commensurate with their means something was said about mrs hubert stamford remaining at wantabalry with her father while her husband went forth again on his task of subduing the waste but that young woman replied promptly with the opening words of an ancient family record where thou goest i will go 
in reference to the possibly rude architecture of their abode she declared that if hubert had only a packing-case to live in she being his wife thought it her duty to live there with him after this of course there was no more to be said and the catathon sailing soon afterwards for the uttermost northern port had in her passenger list the names of mr and mrs hubert stamford and servant from this time forth the star of stamford family was manifestly in the ascendant for not only did their undertakings flourish and the sons and daughters of the house grow in favour with god and man but every one bound to them by the ties of kindred or friendship prospered exceedingly the debt on wantabalry was cleared off in due time while the glastonbury thorn seemed to have taken deep root in the northern wilds of the far land to which it had been carried and to bring a blessing upon the dwellers around its sacred stem the colonel lived rather a solitary existence at the home station after willoughby had departed again for the north but he got into the way of going to sydney for the summer where the australian club afforded him congenial society with a certainty of comradeship at the nightly whist table mr and mrs hubert stamford returned after a year's absence the latter though having lost something of her english freshness of complexion by no means delicate of health and very proud of the infant harold whose steadfast eyes and bold brow marked him out as a future pioneer neither were sorry to abide with the colonel for a season and hubert threw out hints about the far north being too hot for any white woman although rosalind would rather die than admit it she's the pluckiest little woman in the world i believe he said didn't she wash and cook for me and donald the whole month we were without a servant i believe she'd have kept the station accounts too if we had let her but i don't want to run risks mr and mrs stamford being more impartial observers were of opinion that a change would be beneficial to both the young people hubert was too thin to satisfy the maternal eye she believed that he had never properly got over that horrid fever and ague attack and of course hubert would never give in but really as the boy had done so well wouldn't it be a nice time for them to run home for a year or two the station was settling down and as mr greenhow had been taken into partnership surely he could manage things for a time it would benefit hubert in every way and as he had never been home of course they would like him to see a little of the world something of this sort may have occurred to mr stamford but he had refrained in order to permit his more cautious helpmate to propose the extravagant notion he shook his head oracularly said he would think over it and if it was decided mind if after due consideration it turned out to be feasible he thought it would do barrington and laura a great deal of good too barrington would knock himself up if they didn't mind he was such a terribly constant worker and so conscientious that he did not permit himself the relaxation that other men in his position would have claimed what a splendid idea exclaimed mrs stamford my dear harold you always seem to hit upon the exact thing we have all been thinking of but have hesitated about mentioning it will be the saving of barrington and as for laura the great dream of her life will be fulfilled i know she almost pined for rome and florence but she told me once she did not think they could afford it for some years to come i can afford it though said mr stamford with pardonable exultation things have prospered with us lately and what have we to think of in this world but our children's happiness barrington shall have a check for a thousand the day their passage is taken as for hubert he can draw one for himself now thank god without interviewing his banker mrs stamford was an economical and intelligent woman as to her household accounts but she had the vague idea of business common to her sex she knew in a general way from her son and husband that the stations were all paying and improving in value so she accepted the situation without further inquiry 
when her husband therefore spoke of drawing so large a cheque for travelling expenses she was not alarmed as she would once have been at the idea of paying a tenth part of the amount but regarded the apparent profusion of money in the family as a consequence of the higher standard of pastoral property which they had been so wonderfully guided to reach hitherto has the lord helped us she quoted softly to herself may his mercy be around our paths and shield those who are dear to us from every evil the news that a trip to the old country was not only possible but considered expedient and in a sense necessary came with the effect of a delightful surprise upon both couples hubert had in a hazy contemplative way been revolving the idea but had not thought it likely that it could be arranged in less than three or four years but now brought face to face with the idea he found it to be unexpectedly practicable there was no very complicated work or management necessary for two or three years donald greenhaw who had now a fourth share was fully able to superintend the ordinary station work fencing branding the increase and selling the fat stock were operations which he could conduct as well as in a sense better than hubert could himself in case anything happened to him and such things have occurred ere now disastrously for the absentee partner there was willoughby with whom he could leave a power of attorney on the spot all that was wanted was to increase the cattle herd from five thousand head to twenty and that would not half stock the runs the sheep of course were right one man of experience could see to that process nearly as well as another barrington hope too urged by his wife who was fully of opinion that he worked too hard also that a purely sedentary life was drawing fresh lines upon his brow and prematurely aging him pressed firmly his claim for a lengthened vacation to that end a relieving manager was appointed to take his place during his absence when he found that mr stamford's liberality was about to take such a pleasing form he was indeed surprised as well as gratified that gentleman felt it necessary to make a slight explanation as to his private means but he merely mentioned that he was now possessed of certain family funds not available at the time of their first acquaintance and could therefore well afford the outline as for laura it seemed as if the old days of nursery tales had come back the fairy godmother had arisen and gifted her with a precise form of happiness previously as impossible as a slice of the moon it had long been the wish of her heart to behold to wander amid those historic relics those wondrous art creations those hallowed spots with which her reading and her imaginative faculty had rendered her so familiar it was her favorite dream for middle life when years of self-denial and steady industry had wrought out the coveted independence then the journey into the land of ancient fame of wonder mystery and romance was to be their reward but to think of its being vouchsafed to them in their youth before the stern counsel of middle age with its slower heart currents had warned them that the years were slowly advancing fated to carry with them the best treasures of life and oh gracious destiny in the full tide of youthful feeling of the joyous exulting sense of happiness born of the unworn heart of youth now to bestow on them these all priceless luxuries it was more than wonderful it was magical who were they to have so much undeserved happiness showered upon them hubert and rosalind would join them perhaps to part in england for a while but they would roam the continent together they could in company gaze upon the dead giantess rome the city by the sea even venice resting under the shade of german pine forests they could listen to weird legends beneath the shadow of the hearts mountains oh joy glory peace unspeakable what an astonishing change in their life history and to think that in less than a month so it had been ordered they would be saying farewell to the land of their birth it was felt by the colonel and willoughby to be an unfair stroke of destiny that rosalind 
the chief joy and glory of their life should be spirited away to europe but her father also considered that when in queensland she was virtually as far from his ken while the pleasures and advantages procurable from the former locality bore no comparison with the latter there was an unspoken wish also on the part of the elder relatives that the australian contingent should enjoy the inestimable advantage of beholding with their own eyes the wonders of the other hemisphere of forming an alliance by personal experience with the glory and the loveliness the literature and art of the ancient world to endure in memory's treasure-house till life's latest hour End of chapter seventeen Chapter eighteen of Plain Living by Rolf Boulderwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter eighteen. Barrington Hope could hardly realize the fact till he found himself actually on board of a mail steamer that he would have no business cares for the next two years, a whole Elysium of rest and recreation. For this respite from the figure and fact mill, Laura was deeply grateful, sensible as she had been for some months past that the calculating machine was working under occasional effort. When the Hubert Stamfords and Hopes bestowed themselves on board the Lahore, the last triumph of the Peninsular and Oriental Company, one would have thought all Sydney was coming to say farewell. Such was the congregation on the deck and in the magnificent saloon of that noble vessel. Of course, the Colonel and Willoughby, Mr. and Mrs. Stamford, and all their Sydney friends turned out on purpose to see them off, as the phrase is, according to British etiquette on such occasions. Other people, friends, and relatives had come to say farewell to their wives and daughters, sons and sweethearts. Thus many a saddened countenance and tearful eye were to be noted as the great steamer moved slowly astern and then glided at half speed down the harbor. Of their safe and pleasant voyage, of fast friends and congenial acquaintances made on board and parted from with regret, what need to speak? Of the entrance to fairyland which the first few months sojourn in the dear old island so closely resembles for home returning australians of the stories of information acquired of the intoxicating luxury of mere existence under such conditions of the transcending of all anticipation and belief barrington hope and laura remained in europe for the full term of their holiday two years but six months ere that period closed hubert and his wife became impatient to return to their life task in the southland too satiated with mere sensuous enjoyment to remain longer we are young and strong thank god said hubert it's not as though we did not see our way to be back here again within a reasonable time but my work lies in australia and i can't settle to this kind of easy-going life just yet when windigill downs is in thorough working order and fully stocked we can treat ourselves to a run home every five years or so without feeling uneasy about the seasons or anything else so we'll just take our passage by the next boat and wake them up at morima once more i'm ready dearest said his wife with you i think our work is only half done and the sooner we commence life in earnest the better we've seen picture galleries enough to last us for the next few years and i begin to pine for a sight of my dear old father and willoughby poor boy i wonder how they are getting on at wantabalry once more the family circles were replenished irradiated by the old love and tenderness in the persons of the wanderers once more grateful hearts were full to overflowing and humble thanks were offered up to the supreme power which had permitted their happy reunion in spite of perils by land and sea the thousand chances of danger and death which had 
irrevocably marred less fortunate households all had gone well in their absence linda and her sailor love had been made mutually happy and through the exercise of judicious local interest captain fitzurse as he was now proudly styled by mankind and his adoring bride had secured a colonial appointment involving naval duty but not forbidding the occupation of one of those delightful marine residences of which sydney boasts so many perfect specimens donald greenhaw had amply justified the confidence bestowed on him the stations were growing and flourishing to the fullest extent of sanguine expectation willoughby had developed into a stalwart bushman properly bronzed and duly experienced in all pastoral lore the seasons out back had been good nothing was wanting of all the conditions of permanent prosperity of all the members of the two families so happily united and thankfully enjoying their unwanted success universally admired and envied mr stamford alone seemed to be laden with care at times abstracted and preoccupied silent and grave amidst the family hilarity at whist striking out confusing lines of play for which no precedent could be found such was his departure in general behaviour from the ordinary cheerful and equable habit that his wife and children commenced seriously to fear that the unwanted prosperity had turned his head or that old anxieties had induced morbid action of the brain the colonel shook his head as he delicately alluded to the melancholy fact in a walk with rosalind it would grieve him to the heart he didn't think really he could stay on at watabori that a man who could lead from a weak suit and play the queen of hearts when the king was still in petto must be suffering from incipient softening of the brain was patent to him the fact was that mr stamford had come to the conclusion that the time had arrived when it was necessary to make a clean breast of his secret and he did not like the idea at all when the matter was buried in his own breast and in that of mr worthington than whom his own iron safe was not more reticent of office secrets it did not like other hidden deeds appear so frightful but now after all these years to be compelled to tell his wife and children who believed that they shared every thought of his heart that he had carefully wilfully artfully concealed from them the knowledge of their true position he could hardly stand up and face the idea what if his children should resent this want of all confidence would his wife think that all her love and trust deserved a different return mr stamford wiped his heated brow and thought the position unendurable still the motive was a good one a pure one even practical and how had it worked the result might not have directly proceeded from the means employed but still everything had followed for which he had hoped and prayed his children had not shrunk from any test of self-denial of fortitude of continuous industry rendered necessary by the apparent narrowness of their fortunes true they were at the same time actuated by filial reverence and family love swayed by the tenets of that religious teaching which from their infancy had been unwaveringly inculcated but could these influences have been sufficiently strong to counteract the strong currents of ease and pleasure the soft zephyrs of flattery the clinging weight of indolence all urging towards the wreck strewn shore of self-indulgence when once the fatal knowledge should be acquired that all care for the morrow was superfluous who shall say had not the fate of his friend's family the melancholy failure of even his modest aspirations for social distinction been as a beacon light and a warning as it was every noble feeling every desire to spare no effort either of mind or body which could tend to raise the fortunes and to lighten the hearts of those so dear to him had been stimulated and intensified in his son and heir by the sharp urgency and weight of the alternative his daughters had emulated their mother's virtues and with uncomplaining patience had endured isolation monotony plain living 
and sparing apparel for this they had had their reward doubtless but would all these fragrant flowers of the soul have thriven and bloomed in the ungenial soil of luxury and the indolence born of unwanted uncounted wealth whatever had been his sin of omission or commission could he barely be chargeable with apathy as to the welfare of his children for them and in their interest he had striven in every conscious hour from that of their birth until now for them he had toiled and endured hardness had hoped and prayed for their welfare in this world and the next was his every waking thought engaged other than these had he no pleasure worthy of a name in the latter years of a life now approaching slowly but still approaching the inevitable close he had it was true chosen an unusual mode but withal an intelligible course of action looking at the question in all its points and pushing the reasoning on either side to its conclusion mr stamford began to find his position more tenable than he had expected after all he had only done in life what most people did in death reserved the distribution of his fortune until a later period for the eventual benefit of his children thus fortified mr stamford having made up his mind as the phrase runs resolved to communicate the terrible secret fully and finally to his assembled family that very evening being averse to spoiling another night's rest with a burden of thought the weight of which had become so oppressive it happened that the colonel and willoughby were at windigo so mr stamford rightly judged that it would save all after trouble of explanation if he made his budget speech when nearly all concerned were present partly in deference to the colonel's habitudes and those of the european travellers the fashion of a late dinner had been revived at windigo everybody had been unusually cheerful the never-failing fund of continental or english experiences had been drawn upon over the walnuts and the wine or rather when grapes and peaches were receiving attention hubert had been laughingly threatening rosalind with a dozen more years of queensland life when mr stamford stood up and remarked that the time has arrived when he felt it his duty to make a statement which had been for reasons of his own postponed perhaps unnecessarily so however it deeply concerned the interests of all present directly or indirectly and as he said before the time had come for him to explain he might say and disclose the uh, uh, affair here mr stamford who was not a fluent speaker became aware that though he had not furnished a particularly accurate termination to his last sentence he had at all events sufficiently puzzled not to say alarmed his audience he therefore filled his glass and sipped it slowly while mrs stamford looked wistfully at him laura gazed with fully opened eyes in which might be observed a slight glimmer of dread hubert waited calmly for the next words and mr hope and the colonel politely preserved a studied indifference rosalind took the cue from her husband and betrayed no uneasiness by word or gesture my dearest wife my children my friends the speaker proceeded what i have to tell you is rather of a pleasing than of an alarming nature the only awkwardness of my position arises from uncertainty as to whether i ought to have said what i do now several years ago i can truly assert that it is the only secret i ever kept from my dear wife or even from my children since they arrived at years of discretion here everybody's face expressed different degrees of amazement the orator continued the leading fact is that i am a much richer man than is generally supposed hear hear from the colonel in a year we all remember well as you will see by the date of this letter i was left one hundred and seventy thousand pounds or thereabouts by a relative you do not forget the dry year in which we were so nearly ruined we recovered our position chiefly through the well-considered safe yet liberal action of my dear son-in-law 
barrington hoped the gratitude i felt for the way in which he then acted strictly consonant as it was with the proper business principles is still warm and fresh in my recollection here laura's eyes sparkled immediately after this comparative good fortune i received this letter which told me of a bequest beyond all hope or expectation it rendered me a rich a very rich man as fortunes go in australia circumstances which then came under my observation caused me to doubt whether a sudden accession of wealth would act beneficially upon the as yet unformed characters of my darling children up to that period their dispositions their principles had been all the fondest parent could have wished why then run the risk of an alteration necessarily for the worse would they so continue under a total change of conditions and prospects i felt doubtful judging from analogy so deeply was the danger to them at such a critical period of their lives borne in upon me that i took time to consider my course of action finally after deep thought and earnest prayer i resolved to withhold the important intelligence to permit them to remain in ignorance of aught but a gradual relief from threatened ruin in short i elected to live our old life gradually modified and developed until in course of time their characters had acquired maturity with that strength to resist all ordinary temptation which i hoped and trusted the coming years would bring my secret was known to but one man our trusted legal adviser and friend mr worthington meanwhile i proposed judiciously to improve our mode of living and to provide by degrees such indulgences as befitted our apparent position you can judge whether i have kept the promise which i then made to myself whether our cherished ideal of plain living and high thinking has been reached here mrs stamford approached her husband and placed her hand in his amid the silent astonishment which pervaded the company i have only now to say that all things shape themselves in every respect as i could have wished i am the happiest and proudest father this day in australia i can trust my beloved children in ripened manhood and womanhood with the full knowledge of their altered position and i ask their forgiveness and that of my dearest wife for the apparent want of confidence involved in this my first and last secret as far as they are concerned here mr stamford resumed his seat and looked round vainly for any sign of dissent before other comment was possible his wife turned towards him with a countenance expressive of the purest tenderness the most loving and perfect confidence my darling husband she said you lay too much stress on the reserve necessary for your purpose as the head of the family you had a perfect right to give or withhold the information have you not always considered the best interests of us all you might have taken me into your confidence perhaps but no child of ours would dream of questioning your action in this or any other matter could we have been happier with all the money in the world and so say all of us my dear old governor said hubert walking round to his father's chair and shaking his hand warmly a proceeding which was quickly followed by barrington hope willoughby and colonel dacre i should never have stuck to my collar or been half the fellow if i had thought years ago that work or play was optional with us would never have tackled the things that now i feel proud and happy to have carried through never had such a little wife most likely either in her name in all our names i thank you from my heart for what she did laura's arms had been for some moments round her father's neck her feelings were too deep for words her tears were those of relief and gratitude the colonel made an opportune diversion by expressing a hope that his esteemed friend's whist would now undergo a beneficial change his sudden deterioration of form had he confessed caused him the colonel great uneasiness even alarm now that the murder was out and his breast unburdened of its dreadful secret 
he felt confident they would return to their former most enjoyable social relations as a friend a father and an antagonist in the king of games he begged to be permitted to congratulate him most warmly and sincerely end of chapter eighteen end of plain living by rolf boulderwood